April 12th, regular uh, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, will the cl uh, clerk call the roll, please? Chairman Lynch. Present. Councilor Backer. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor McGinty. Here. Councilor Moles. Councilor Roberts. Present. Council Swift Kayata. Here. Student Representative Armstrong. Here. Student Representative Lynn. Manager McGovern. And Clerk Cabana. Here. And I would like to welcome our new clerk, Deborah Cabana. This is her first night uh, officially on the job at our town council meeting. She's been working two weeks now, and so uh, I'd like to welcome her to her new duties as the clerk to the town of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, the next thing is the Pledge of Allegiance. next item I will come down to the podium for, and I'd like to ask um, Terry Curtis and his swim team captains to join us. With me here tonight are the captains of the Cape Elizabeth Girls swim team. Uh, Skylar Armstrong, who is also the student body representative to our town council, Sarah Graw, Taylor McFarland, and Catherine Alexander, and of course, Coach Curtis. And we have a proclamation because they have won um, this state championship yet again. So I will read aloud the proclamation. Whereas the Cape Elizabeth girls swim team earned the 2004 Maine Class A state championship and whereas this victory was the third straight state championship, which is a tremendous achievement for a relatively small school participating in Class A sports and whereas the team includes two academic All-Americans and three Maine All-State academics and Whereas the girls swim team has four young women who are swimming and diving all Americans and the team received an award from the National Interscholastic Swim Coaches Association for a gold level achievement for a cumulative 3.85 grade point average. Now, therefore be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council that we hereby congratulate the Cape Elizabeth High School girls swimmers and divers on the state championship and on their academic achievement. And we salute them, their coaches, their parents, their teachers, and all others whose efforts helped lead to the state championship and to their academic excellence. And it's dated this 12th day of April, 2004. And if you'll join me in. and good luck to all of you next year, those of you going up to college and those of you who might be swimming again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is reports and correspondence. Is there anyone who has anything to report to the town council? Councillor Swift Kayata. Um, I just thought of this. We have been televising the um, first three finance committee meetings, and I just wanted to let the public know that the next one will be this Wednesday, two nights from t tonight, with the school board. It will be on the school board budget, and um, we encourage people to tune in and watch or read their local media reports or give input or whatever, but um, 
please be informed because it's a very important process. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other reports for correspondence? Okay. Um, how about the town manager? No report. No report. And the next item is the minutes of two recent meetings that we've had. We'll take those up separately. If I can have a motion, please. Can I just ask a question? There was a copy, a new copy of the minutes that we had on the podium tonight. Is that an, I assume that's an updated version. I didn't even, I didn't see a new. Yeah, I have two for March 18th, mm -hmm. I assume. Just a formatting issue. Oh. Just formatting? Oh. Formatting. I would move that we accept the minutes for the regular meeting on Monday, March 8, 2004, and for the special town council meeting on Thursday, March 18, 2004. Second. Is there any discussion? Councilor Fritz. I would just like to pose uh, an addition um, on the March 18 minutes. Um, it says that Councilor C. Fritz arrives at 720. I would like to add to that due to rescheduling of simultaneous meetings at IWS. Um, does, any, does anyone have a, any objection to that? Okay. We'll take that as a friendly amendment then. Yes. Yeah. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's seven zero. Thank you. Okay, and the next item is citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. So if you are here and you would like to bring something to the council's attention and it is not an item which is on the agenda, um, now is your opportunity to speak. Okay, seeing no one, we will, no one who would like to speak, we will go to item 105, which was tabled from March Eight, and I guess the first uh, motion would perhaps be a motion to remove it from the table. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Okay. Now, in your package, this is on the cell phone tower issue. In your package was an outline of four various options for motions put um, together by the town manager. Obviously, there are a variety of other uh, motions that could be offered, but I just walk you through those. The first um, option one would be to approve the tower overlay district as um, recommended by the planning board and that is the first map in your package. Option two would be to approve the creation of a uh, revised location of the tower overlay district as shown on the map prepared April 7, 2004, and that is the second map in your package. And the third option uh, recommended by the manager would be um, to not approve the creation of a tower overlay district, but to encourage the Sprague Corporation and interested parties to review in coming weeks the creation of a tower overlay district in the vicinity of the so-called ridge area in the area of Bowery Beach Road, Fowler Road, and Charles E. Jordan Road. And then option four, is to not approve the creation of a tower overlay district. Did I get all that right? Thank you. So those are um, four of the options that the town manager put together, I think, to help us in our thinking. And um, there's actually a fifth option on. Option five, I'm sorry, to table the issue to the May 10th meeting. So, is there a motion? As, as a point of information, I would note that if, um, if someone were to make a motion to table, there could be no discussion. That's the correct. Either. The tabling motion is non-debatable. Is there a motion? Councilor um, I want to make sure I understand what option number four is uh, before a motion is made. 
Um, option four is for the council to not approve the creation of a tower overlay district as shown on the map prepared by the planning office dated April 7, that's the new one, uh, nor the district shown on the map dated April 7. What, uh, I'm not sure I understand what that means. It's intended to approve neither the April 7th map nor the February 4th map. So, so that first April 7th should be February 4th. Okay, so that should refer to February, it, neither February 4 nor April 7. That's correct. So the only difference then between 3 and 4 is, um, well, they both um, disapprove the two proposed overlay districts, but option 3 encourages the Sprague Corporation to consider the ridge. And, and I think encourages the various interested parties to try and get together and hammer out a resolution. And specifically speak to interested parties, Councillor Backman and Councillor Mould. Well, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Um, I move that the uh, council not approve the creation of a tower overlay district is shown on the map prepared by the planning office dated February 4, 2004 and April 7, 2004, uh, but encourage the Sprague Corporation and, inter and, and interested cellular parties to review in the coming weeks the creation of a tower overlay district in the vicinity of the so-called ridge in the area of Bower Bowery Beach Road, Bower Road and Charles E. Jordan Road but with the understanding that that encouragement certainly doesn't mean that the council would act one way or another on any return to the council with a new proposed district, but at least gives us the opportunity for further discussion. Councilor Mould. Second that motion. Okay. Is there any discussion? Councilor McKinsey. I'm, I got the message. I'm opposed to any tower overlay district in that vicinity. I think that the Sprague's always have the option to go back to the tower come and discuss another option. They can bring it forward, you know, again if they want. Um, but I, I'm going to be voting no against the, this uh, particular option because I don't think there should be a district there at all. And I want the people to understand that. And as I said, I think that they always have the option of meeting with whoever they want to meet and you know, try to do whatever they want to do with their property. But I'll be opposing this motion for that purpose. Councilor Becker. Um, if I could speak to that and perhaps be the only other time I'll, I'll speak as to this issue tonight. Um, I don't, for a minute, mean to suggest that I'm in favor of a tower overlay district in the Fowler Road area. I'm not quite sure what the ridge specific location is or what that would mean in terms of the visibility of the tower from 77, from Fowler Road, um, or from anywhere else because I don't know quite where on the ridge that would be. I would just like to have the opportunity perhaps to see if LCC and if the Sprague Corporation have a site in mind, I'd like to see it flagged, staked out in some manner so I can at least walk back there and see where it is uh, before I say absolutely no to any tower in that area. Um, I'm sensitive to all the arguments we've received from the Fowler Road residents, and not just the Fowler Road residents, from town residents generally. Um, I'm not limiting this to, to the people who live in the Fowler Road area. Um, I would also like to see, before we say yay or nay to anything, I'd like to see what comes back from the planning board. Uh, the planning, at the planning board workshop this last week, my understanding is that they set for public hearing at their next 
meeting, um, well, actually, I'm not sure whether it's the April meeting or the May meeting, but they set for public hearing the issue of the Shore Acres site and whether that might be appropriate through the use of a stealth antenna to provide service to uh, Broad Cove and Shore Acres in some manner. I would like to see what the planning board comes back with on that before I make a decision one way or another on whether we have a tower anywhere in the Fowler Road area or whether a tower is appropriate on Shore Acres or anywhere in town. So I guess all I'm doing, uh, Councilor McGindy, is I'm inviting the Sprague Corporation to show us more uh, before I say no or before I say yes. If uh, Councillor Backer had not made that motion, I was going to make that motion. I've met with Seth Spray several times and never to find an acceptable location for the cell tower. And I went over the map with Seth and we found a spot over the ridge, out of view of Fowler Road, fairly out of view of Route 77 Bowery Beach Road off into the trees in a location that was aesthetically much better than the current proposed location and yet would provide good cell service uh, to that southern end of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, so I, I do support uh, continuing to look at this issue and getting more information back from LCC and the Sprague Corporation. Further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. And opposed? Councilman McGinty. Okay. Next item is item 118. Madam Chair, um, I, I would like to make a motion having to do with cell towers um, for the Council's consideration. Um, I would like to move that the town council request the town planner to gather the following updated information on cell phone technology to provide cell service and to meet public safety needs. Um, and I have four bullets of things to, um, for the planner to provide to us. A selection of wireless communication ordinances from Maine and elsewhere that provides cell phone service through te stealth technology. Second, comprehensive information and examples of stealth technology, including benefits and disadvantages. Three, a contour map of Cape Elizabeth. And four, structures in Cape Elizabeth, both public and private, that could be used as alternatives to new cell towers to relay signals and then report back to the town council. I, I'm proposing this because I feel a great lack of information on alternative technology to these very tall um, cell towers. And I think technology has improved or changed since we had the study five years ago. And I think many communities in the Northeast and even in Maine have developed ordinances and, and um, well, ordinances that cope with cell tower issues since we've dealt with it. And so I, I would like a lot more information reported back to us. I know the planning board is uh, working on this as well, but I think the council needs to have I think the council needs to deal with it. I will second that. I'm going to ask the town manager to just say what he's writing so that we can all have the benefit of his view. Under the, the town charter, the town council cannot order the town planner uh, to do anything. You'd need to order the, the town manager and then I would delegate it. Okay. Uh, to whoever I felt appropriate, which who would probably be, be the planner. Okay. <laughs> my my, or, that my wording was not order, it was request. 
I, I will to request the town manager to. I just, you know, this is, I just wouldn't want the council in the habit of doing that. Okay. I know you meant no harm, but it's sometimes you could, we could have another issue that, that that could be a problem. So there's been a motion and a second, and Councillor Roberts would like to speak to this. Yes, thank you. The um, three or four years ago when we created the Tower Overlay District, we, at that time, it was my understanding that uh, the, the towers or the tower zone up at the Strouts would serve as the primary location to basically cover the town um, on the federal law that existed. And the secondary site at the uh, transfer station or dump, as some of us prefer, would uh, not be a competitor to the Strouts, but in fact would be there as a, uh, a backup should that first site become uh, full. And my understanding at the time when we were voting on that was that we would be pursuing stealth technology and other types of co-location, repeaters, et cetera. And nothing really ever came of it. Um, the issue was not brought forward again until this came forward before us uh, at this time. And for that reason, uh, I would like also to have us g gather some information. And rather than just being a knee-jerk reaction, Take a look at the issue in full, see where we're going and where we want to go with it. Make sure that people are getting the service that they need. Um, my, I believe, based on comments at the planning board the other night, that 80% of the town is actually covered and com we comply with the law. So we're not under the gun on doing that, but I think it should be done as expeditiously as possible because there are folks out there that would like to use their cell phones at home. They would like to be able to use their wireless internet. And I don't want to deny that either. I want to see us proceed to get that kind of coverage. But I want to do it in the right way. Further discussion? Councillor Swift, Kayada. It's not so much discussion, but um, Councillor Fritz, and I'm sure the other councillors know I'm always, almost always, in fact, always in favor of getting to facts. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you um, was did you have a time frame in mind for receipt of? such a report and I didn't know some of the things sounded like they might be expensive so I did I got my finance chair hat on and I'm thinking of budget uh, that's more of a question for the manager is there money available to if we have to you know, get somebody to do outside reports or something I, I didn't through you madam chairman I didn't hear anything in Councilor Fritz's okay. motion that really I'm just it added up Maureen's time but but I didn't hear a whole lot that added up at all I'm just checking the budget stuff from <laughs> budget things I, I just yeah. caution the planning board is extremely busy right now with mm -hmm. with a lot of things before it I, they, they have almost doubled the usual number of gender items that they usually have so you know we'll uh, we uh, Maureen will work on it uh, you know right away but mm -hmm. there is an awful lot of other things on her plate as well okay and the um, time frame question I mean I, I envision much of this as searching the internet for ordinances and um, techniques. Um, I think but I, I did more not about the, to the topographical map or something like that. It's sort of map. Map. That's easy. But yeah, I mean, I we think we have. We, yeah. Okay. Um, as far as time frame, I I did specifically not put a time frame on it. I I don't think that this is a huge rush. I think it's more important to do it right. Okay. And I'm I'm recognizing. Our town planner's time as well. Okay, thank you. Is there further discussion? All in favor? Oh, Councilor Badger. Well, I could have just cut my hand up. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I support the motion as uh, described by Councilor Fritz, and I agree completely with all of Councilor Roberts' comments about the need to make a, an informed decision based on a cohesive set of options instead of addressing this piecemeal as we as we go, which is the way we seem to have been approaching it. So I support it. Councilor Moore. It's, it's a little bit of a, a side issue, but related in that I, I really appreciate all the people that have come down tonight to listen to hear what we have to say on cell towers as it affects their neighborhood. I would just want to ask if we're going to be talking about the over the ridge proposal next month there may be some neighbors further up south
77 that we might want to send a notice to to let them know to, to come down and give us some input on that. That's all. Okay, all in favor of motion? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Thank you. And the next item is public hearing and consideration of a recommendation from the Ordinance Committee to prohibit parking on the southwesterly side of Fenway Road. And in your package is a proposed amendment to the ordinance, which indeed states that there shall be no parking on the southwesterly side of Fenway Road. And I will open the public hearing. Good evening, my name is John Herrick. I'm the current chair of the Conservation Commission. And I'd just like to... Uh, John, can you pull, pull the microphone up? Yes, is that you. better? That's Thank you. I'd just like to uh, remind the uh, council, I'm sure you're already aware, that we had a public hearing on public access to the uh, Great Pond area last year. And parking is a significant issue, was a significant issue during that public hearing. We solicited the opinions of the neighborhood and other people interested in uh, access to Great Pond. We do feel, in looking at the parking situation, uh, that parking on Fenway Road was the most appropriate um, solution to the parking problem. There were other potential parking pro uh, situations that we looked at and decided that would be the best. As long as it is, it is, it, it is consistent, with rules and regulations as uh, directed by the council for safety and proper passage of vehicles and so on. We do not, would not approve any uh, parking in the, uh, in the turnaround, just along the side. One side certainly would be, uh, would be appropriate, but I would just wanted to state that the Conservation Commission is that it would be very much in favor of allowing parking on one side of Fenway for public access to Great Pond. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. Is there anyone else here to speak on the issue of parking or no parking on the southwesterly side of Fenway Road? Uh, my name is Fred Brown. I live on 16 Fenway Road. And I certainly don't object to parking on one side of the street or the other. The one question I would like to ask the council is if they do approve this, this parking on one side only, what is going to be the stipulation as far as parking ticket or towing on the other side of the street? This has always been my big beef with the town for 32 years now. When I can't get down the street to get into my home, or if my home should catch on fire, How's the fire truck going to get down there? And the fire chief has told me there's already a state ordinance uh, restricting the construction, the restriction of a street. However, it doesn't really seem to be addressed, and I'd really like to see the town address it, not with just a two or three dollar parking ticket. I'd like to see them post it, no parking, toes on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Is there anyone else here to speak? I am Joyce to Fenway. I live at the corner of Fenway and Fowler. I, ha I have a couple concerns, I guess. One is the no parking. It's only going to be on one side of the street. I don't know if any of you have been to Fenway. Maybe you ought to walk down Fenway someday. There's uh, 16 homes. Most of them have two cars, except for my house, there's six to eight. Um, it's a pretty busy little street with just the people that live on it. Um, if you sit in, I, I, I asked you to go there and sit one day for a dead end street, how busy it is, busy it is for just the people that live on that street. I don't think there's too many minutes that go by that there's not a car going up and down. There's some of us that work in town and we're back and forth on break and back and forth to work. A lot of kids on the street, they play. Um, now we're going to add multi-cars. 
how much traffic can this little tiny street of 16 homes take? How much overflow? Now you're talking about parking on one side or the other. Great, I guess. But what happens when we all have family come to visit? And there's no parking for our family because everybody's parked at Great Pond. Where do we put them? I think, I really think that Jack lives in the neighborhood. He knows the neighborhood, so I don't recommend Jack go. Um, <laughs> some of you go over there and spend an afternoon or morning, kids going up to the school bus, the weekend traffic. Just stand in our neighborhood for an hour and see the traffic flow on Fenway. We're not 77, we're not Fowler Road, we're a dead end street. A dead end street. Now, wouldn't you say, Jack, that you see the amount of traffic that can go up and down that street? It's a very busy street with kids, with homes. I have four boys of my own that two live at home, two don't. They come to park. You can't park on the side of the street. I mean, We've taken a lot in the last year in our neighborhood. Granted, we got the snowmobile trail. We didn't get to venture into that this winter because of no snow. That's a, a little extra. But now you're telling us where we can park and where we can't park. I mean, can't a parking lot go up on Barley Beach and have park and walk? You're gonna have boats that are gonna be launched down there that you're making little things to put in, more traffic. I really think, Michael, that you should pick a few councils to go down to Fenway Road I'll even make coffee and tea. Sit at the top of the road and see the kind of traffic that Fenway Road has for a dead end street. And we do have a lot of children playing there. Thank you, Mrs. Joyce. Is there anyone else here to speak? Okay, seeing none, I will declare the public hearing closed. Is there a motion? That generally does not get read. It's in our packages and it's a matter of public record. It would be addressed. Uh, Excuse me. Address you can come up and you can speak to the council, but the point of this is not a debate. It's for us to hear your views. Uh, Jim Sullivan, 110. Well, it's not a debate. Uh, we had a letter. Um, Frank Fullen made it up that for our concerns. And again, the way I realize and look at this, you folks are probably going to do the one side. Um, I hope not, where I think, um, because of the, the volume of people that live on the street and how is that going to address the resale of our homes. Um, you're making a parking lot out of a residential area, any way you look at it. So the other thing is, the letter is there. I hope you look at it and you address it the best way you possibly can. And that's the only thing I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Is anyone else to come right up to the podium, please? I have some pictures here that were taken this year. We have no parking in the circle at Fenway. These are pictures that were taken in the circle of Fenway. There is supposedly no, it's only a pedestrian right away. Snow machines across that property already. Now, two weeks ago, there were two cars that came down, stopped on the side of the road. About 12 people got out, two loose dogs. The dogs were on my neighbor's property. They were in my garage. They were on my front stairs. My dog is going ballistic in the house because they're on her property. This is consistently what these people do. And if you're going to let people come down there and park, there needs to be something addressed about the dogs being loose. The minute they get out of their cars, be it at the end of Fenway Road or closer to the pond. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak? Okay, I'll declare the public hearing closed again. And is there a motion? Councilor Baffert. As uh, chair of the ordinance committee that considered this, 
I guess the responsibility falls on me to make this motion on the heels of the comments that we've just heard. Um, and I move that the uh, council amend the applicable ordinance to prohibit parking on the southwesterly side of Fenway Road, um, consistent with the um, amendment to 13-2-3Q, as included in our packets. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? <coughs> Councilor Briggs-Piotta. Um, it's not really discussion, it's just, um, I, I think there's a typo in this that just needs to be cleared up on P is the line before the new additional line. Um, it has to do with Gullcrest Drive, the or that is supposed to be at the end of the line, is in mm -hmm. the middle of the line. This one's supposed to be in the line. That's noted. Councillor, I'll go back to Councillor Backer mm -hmm. because he's on the ordinance mm -hmm. committee and then Councillor Mould. I, I, I would like to respond to and acknowledge some of the comments that we just heard rather than just blindly making the motion as if the comments that were made were falling on deaf ears because they weren't. Um, I mean, some of what I heard voiced tonight was a concern that what we are doing by this is making a parking lot out of Fenway Road. To the contrary, we're not encouraging parking on Fenway Road. Parking is permitted on Fenway Road right now. On both sides. Parking is permitted on both sides of Fenway Road right now. What we're trying to do is alleviate the problem of cars parked on both sides of Fenway Road that does not create a free, um, unrestricted lane of travel that will not impede the flow of emergency vehicles or residents coming and going. And that was the whole reason for wanting to restrict parking so that we didn't have uh, Fenway Road loaded with cars on both sides. One of the comments in the uh, letter that was presented to us as part of our packet um, talks about uh, problems with uh, parties and people not respecting property rights, and we've heard about dogs. And the, enforce, the enforcement of existing laws is a separate issue. And I see Chief Williams in the back of the room, and I'm sure everything that has been said tonight um, has been heard by him. And enforcement is another issue that I, I'm sure Chief Williams will take to heart to protect property rights, the dog leash laws, uh, the no parking rule. Um, I can't speak to it beyond that. That's not within uh, my domain. But what we're trying to do is alleviate uh, rather than increase uh, the problem that we've heard about on Fenway Road. And consistent with the Conservation Commission uh, and their recommendation, uh, rather than creating a parking area in the woods and encouraging more people to travel to Great Pond, uh, this seemed to be the best compromise. I will stress that everything is amendable. And if for some reason that this doesn't work and we find that it creates an unnecessary burden on the residents of Fenway Road um, that makes life intolerable in one way or another, the council will and can readdress it. First, I want to thank the residents of Fenway Road that came down here tonight to give input on this and uh, for those that are watching intently at home to see how we vote on this. Um, one of you made a comment earlier that we had already come to some, probably had already come to some decision on which way to vote, and that's not true. Uh, as far as this ordinance goes, I've been to Fenway Road a number of times. I have um, gone there with Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts to go ice fishing in the winter. And we all know that Mrs. Brown doesn't like us parking down in the circle. And as residents of the town, we respect that, 
and we park further up the street. So for those for those of us that are, you know, your typical visitors, we know, you know, enough to be respectful and to park up the street. Uh, and I would hope that all the neighbors in the neighborhood, when they have guests and relatives coming to visit for an event, would be respectful of their neighbors and park as much off the roadway as possible. I don't think that this ordinance uh, solves the problem. I don't think it even comes close to solving the problem and creates more headaches for those people that live on the southwesterly side of the road. Where are they supposed to park? You know, now you have fewer spaces when you have legitimate guests and family coming to visit. Are they going to have to park 300 yards up the street because all the spaces nearby have been taken? Um, you know, I, I think as far as the neighborhood goes, when they have guests, they need to be respectful of each other and keep, them, keep the road less constricted. When the road is constricted, I think you need to pick up the phone, call Chief Williams or the police department and say there's a safety concern here. Please come down and have this person move their car. In the interim, I think we need to find a different solution to this problem. I think we do need to find some legitimate town sanctioned san town sanctioned parking area in the vicinity whether that's in the immediate vicinity or over on bowery beach road uh, but this ordinance does not solve the problem and i'm not voting in favor of it councillor roberts thank you i had hoped to hear from more of the uh, residents on fenway road I uh, actually considered walking down the street and getting a survey to see how they stood on it, but I figured I'd probably run out on a rail, so I didn't bother doing that one. Um, I did, uh, we have four of 16 families basically represented here, and I do have a concern um, of limiting the parking for the reasons that the Mrs. Joyce stated. There are a lot of uh, resident cars down there. It is. Uh, there is a problem with the number of vehicles on that street and in the winter time it's even more of a problem of course because that's been all the people are either ice fishing or skating or whatever else and of course if we have snow that's when the, the roads are the narrowest as well so i recognize there's a safety issue down there um, i am concerned too that uh, if we start towing it's going to be the neighbors that are going to be the the victims of a towing policy because they may have their car there first and if somebody else parks across the street there's not going to be any way for the police to know who was there first or who had the right of way as far as the parking is concerned but and i know that's all over the place but based on the comments i've heard here tonight i uh, i won't bother i won't vote for it i'm going to go with the three out of the four that were here and if the other residents on that street wished different, differently they should have been here so i'll contact you this councillor frick well, I'd just like to mention the, um, the Conservation Commission had a meeting with the neighborhood and proposed five or six different options. I attended that forum and I really thought it was a, a good discussion about which, which of the options were acceptable. Uh, I mean, one option had been to take a... Um, a path that has brush in it but that is legally available for a right-of-way down the back of some of the uh, Fenway Road uh, one side of the back of their home. That was not a very acceptable option to the neighbors. Um, I, and I think um, there was considerable discussion about a parking area that was designated with the Great Pond Condominium Complex for access to Great Pond and that was, I don't think, seen as a good option by the neighbors and I came away and the Conservation Commission came away with consensus that limiting parking on Fenway was much the best option. So I will support this option because of, I, we had not only the input tonight in the public hearing but the neighborhood meeting with the Conservation Commission and I thought it was very well done. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? I truly appreciate the hard work that the Conservation Commission does. Uh, however, I don't think, I think this is a case where the majority that forms a consensus at one meeting should be able to take the rights away from a minority that either weren't 
able to come to that meeting or were outvoted. Um, this is clearly, you know, a situation where if you take away parking from that side of the street, I feel it does diminish the property values on that side of the street, and I don't think that's fair to those residents. I think we need to get back together and find another solution to this. Further discussion? Councilor McGinty. I'm going to support the motion. Uh, Dave said everything I could say about the enforcement issues and the safety issues. Um, and, you know, we hashed a lot of this out previously, so I'll be supporting the motion. Councilor Swift, hey, Ida. I'll be supporting it also. We had extensive discussion about this at the Ordinance Committee meeting, and I too followed, um, I was not present, but I followed up and found um, the results of the previous meetings, the public that were open to the public with the Conservation Commission. And um, it was, the con it was my under it is my understanding that the consensus was rather than putting a parking lot in the area, which would attract more people, that the best way to deal with the traffic, um, the consensus of the neighbors, perhaps not everyone who is here today, but the consensus um, was that this was the best way to deal with it. And I agree with Councilor Bassley that of course it needs to be enforced, but I think rather than having the current situation, which is haphazard parking on both sides of the street, I think this is an improvement. So I will be supporting it. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion? One, two, three, four, five. Opposed? Councillors Roberts and Miles. Okay, next item is item 112, which was tabled at our last month's meeting. <coughs> Just take a break for 15 seconds to clear the room. <coughs> Okay, at our meeting in March, um, we tabled the, uh, the request to approve the contract with Peyton Construction as the construction manager for the high school. That had been tabled because we received the, the contract about 10 minutes before our council meeting and we had been unable to review it. So uh, I guess the first item, first action that might be in order, but perhaps not, be to take it off the table. So moved. Second. And all in favor of taking it off the table? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So another motion. Um, Councilor Swift, Swift there. <laughs> I know your name. <laughs> <laughs> Get some from me, Anne. Um, <laughs> I don't have a motion at the moment. I am not a member of the building committee, and I have some questions, and I, if we want to wait till left, there's a motion, I can ask my questions after that, but I, I need a little more information, like, has the building committee voted okay. on this? Or I think have because they approved the plans we might have another motion to table this for a day or two. Um, I'll allow your questions in the discussion now without a motion on the table. Okay. Well, I would like to know from my fellow counselors or the manager who um, are members of the building committee, and it just doesn't have to be, you know, a real long report or anything, but um, I'm not very up to date. I haven't seen much information on this, and I'd like to know, has the building committee voted on this document? Are they in agreement with this? Have they approved the plans, whatever plans there are now, for the school project? What's the current estimate versus what the citizens voted on? Cost estimate, those sorts of things. So I'm looking for some information. Councilor Backer, you're a member of the committee. Oh. Would you like to? So you're you're, 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 looking, you're looking, your way. looking to me to answer <laughs> Councilor Swift Hayata. I can answer those questions. Oh, go um, <laughs> The building committee has not approved this contract um, at they, the last... They just haven't voted on it or they've disapproved it? Uh, neither. Okay. Um, the uh, our last meeting was 
on Thursday. I've lost track of what Thursday. month this even is. <laughs> Uh, last Wednesday was the last building committee meeting. Um, at that time, I think we had just received, the counselors had just received their packets for this meeting, perhaps even that day, which would have been the first time that we as counselors would have seen this contract, and that we as building committee members would have even seen this contract. To the best of my knowledge, none of the members of the building committee um, have seen this contract yeah. as of our last meeting. Okay. So the building committee members um, have not discussed this contract in any okay. manner to either uh, approve it, disapprove it, or comment on it. Okay. With regard to your question as to whether or not the building committee has approved plans, um, we have not approved plans um, for the high school. We, have they been considered or just? Um, we have, <coughs> at our Wednesday meeting, uh, we were sort of shown a visual walkthrough of the project. Um, I don't know whether it's fair to call those formal plans or not. <coughs> um, I would say we certainly have not approved any plans at this stage. We have not been presented with formal plans for approval one way or another. Um, nor have we uh, been presented with any estimated costs of the project. Okay. And I think that answers all three of your questions. Okay, then that would raise the, just to finish off my comment, thank you, first of all. Um, I was not aware of the answers to those questions, but it raises my concern that I, I've got some concerns. I, I just feel it seems as though the building committee we're, we're sort of uh, getting ahead of ourselves if the building committee hasn't looked at. They're the experts who are supposed to be managing this project so far. And so maybe, maybe I'm confused about process. Yeah. It, it's not clear to me why the contract didn't come to the building committee. Um, for approval, we have a, at least one person on the uh, committee, and really several experts, but one in particular has taken a look at the contract and raised some concerns um, with us um, earlier today, us being um, the members, the town council members of the building committee. Um, and we just got this today. I did try and reach Elaine Maloney, who's the chairman of the building co committee, and was unable to reach her today. So um, before I make a motion, I guess I would like to suggest we are meeting Wednesday night in a workshop. I imagine you're all there. We, and we the council. We the council. At, at are the finance committee meeting? In the, as a finance committee. But it strikes me we could have a meeting as a council if necessary to approve the contract. I'm just a little concerned that there are a couple of questions here um, that need to be addressed. But if I'm the only one that feels that way, I don't know how Councillor Backer feels. Is the building committee meeting in be before no. our Wednesday meeting? No. So the building, the building committee is not meeting for another month. <laughs> so we would be approving this before the building committee? I'm, I'm very concerned not, about the process. I mean, doesn't seem logical to me. Uh, but perhaps I'm, I don't know, if, I'd be interested in what my other town, fellow counselors think. Councilor Fritz. I didn't see any dollar contract, not, not for the school building or any additions, but just for the construction <coughs> manager. There is, of there is not. The way it is constructed, the way the contract is constructed, so to speak, is that the construction manager will come back after becoming intimately familiar with the project and then propose a price to do the work. And that's how this contract envisions for the construction manager on the high school. The kindergarten is a straight fixed price out to bid contract. This is envisioned to be a different approach in part because of the difficulty of the job 
um, we're doing it while in a building with 600 kids and teachers and it requires elaborate staging and planning and whatnot. So uh, this school has gotten the permission of the state uh, to not do the typical low bid competitive bid process and instead you hire uh, the best construction manager you can find and then you negotiate the price with them. And this is something that has been done before. I don't think anyone feels that this is, uh, my understanding is of those who are um, expert in this area, that that w is a preferable approach to this kind of job. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you may. Yeah, a, a construction manager, uh, as has been said, uh, in this proposal, and I, I have to admit I haven't studied it, uh, Liam McGrath, a member of the committee, came in Friday and asked for a copy of it, and I gave him my copy, and I, I don't have another one yet, but I could have asked one and haven't yet. But anyway, uh, you know, this states a certain percentage that the construction manager would get for organizing the work and for overseeing it, and then they also come back, they go out and get the sub bids from all the, 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 uh, the subcontractors, uh, and those are approved, you know, then they, those come back as a whole package, and they'd be reviewed and, you know, approved by the building committee at that point. That's where you get all the price on construction manager. However, what's missing right now and uh, is usually in a construction project, as the building committee is meeting with the architect, you have what's called a 50% review, and then then you have like a, an 80% review, or it, it, it varies somewhat, but those generally where those reviews occur. And at those times of the review, the building committee would say, yes, this, this is fine, move on. In, in this case, I don't think the building committee has ever taken a formal vote on any issue. Maybe they have, but I don't remember any formal vote. And if the other thing, at that 50 and 80% level, there'd be an updating of the original estimate uh, for, in this case, the high school project for you, but also be the kindergarten proposal. It'd be a 50 and 80% estimate. And while I haven't, I haven't had every building committee meeting, but I haven't heard any presentation of either of those estimates so that you know, when the bids actually came in, you know, you know, you need, you need the, the benchmark to, to compare them again. As you know, one, right now all we have is, a, is an estimate that was done uh, at the conceptual stage, just before any design was done. And, you know, we haven't, as a, I serve as an ex-official member of the building, and you're not always there, but I, you know, I try to be there, but we haven't seen any estimates since the conceptual and one that the citizens voted on. And and how Usually that be updated as design occurs. How long ago were those estimates? I mean, those were the, on the ones that were, no, those were the ones that were prepared last summer in the anticipation of the election. They were prepared the conceptual. About a year ago. Oh, they were about a year ago. Yeah. Councilor McGinter. I, I also have a concern about this. I mean, what if we approve this and then the building committee either modifies it or doesn't approve it? Um, I mean, I, it seems to me, whoever said, you know, we kind of got the cart before the horse there. So. Well, I, I had a second question. Yes. Do we know if this was approved by the town attorney? It's the school board's attorney reviewed it and approved, approved it. it. So that's the way it's the school board. Okay. I think the motion might be, oh, Councilor Roberts. I'm going to get myself in trouble by speaking, you realize that, don't you? But I've been on or sat in on a number of building committees over the years, going back to public works and everything else. Most of the committees seem to be more involved in the, how the thing was flowing, voting on issues as they came up. I didn't make the meeting last Wednesday, and we had the two late nights, and I just was not up to that third night in a row. And I didn't really feel like I was going to be missing much, quite frankly. Um, we need some changes there. And even early on in the process, um, every building committee that I've been seeing, or either in this community or where I work, uh, when you have a building committee for municipal purposes, usually the chair of the committee is a citizen of the community and not an elected board member. Well, even that is done differently. Everything seems to be funneling through the school department rather than the committee. Well, for what it's worth, um, 
I'm not real happy with the way the committee's functioning and are operating, and maybe it works, maybe it's fine in some circles, but it's not what I'm used to. So. I guess I would just like to suggest we table this contract until Wednesday, at which point we can have another meeting if necessary, and in the meantime have some conversations. I think the council members of the school building committee should have some conversations with the school board about um, the contract, the particular issues that were raised in the contract. And whatever other issues people want to raise. Second. Point of information. Point of information. Um, would that be before the final committee meeting? I mean, it would start at 7.30. I'm just trying to figure where yeah, I think this. We, it, to me, it would make more sense to do it before the final committee meeting just because. Is that acceptable to everyone? We meet at 7? Uh, sure, or even if we start at 7.30, I just meant in, in okay. terms of the order of the meeting. Mm -hmm. To me, it makes more sense to do it before because it has a whole lot of sure. financial implications. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have a point of order also? Because we've had a motion to table. Which is okay. Seconded, so it's not debatable. Um. Point of information. <laughs> Point of information. <laughs> <laughs> I question whether a two-day tabling of this is sufficient. I think it should be tabled for longer than two days um, in order to permit us to address the various questions about some of the specific uh, terms of the contract and some of the issues um, that we've heard raised. When is our next meeting after Wednesday as a group wearing either finance committee hat or workshop hat or any other? The 28th. It's the 28th, but that's the mega meeting. That's, that's the last finance committee meeting. I guess, I, David, I would suggest we can table it for two days, and if we need more time, we can leave it on the table yes. till the 28th. Okay. Okay. This is not. This is, yes, I was. I was just going to ask: Is there enough uh, notice time? Two days sufficient yes. notice time of a meeting? The, the, the rule is that for notification is that all counselors need to be notified at least 24 hours in advance, unless they sign a waiver for a period of less time. But this is 48 hours. That's my question. Okay. All in favor of tabling? Till Wednesday. Till Wednesday. Okay, the next item, item 119, is action to call a special municipal election on Tuesday, June 8th, 2004, concurrent with the state primary to fill a vacancy on the Cape Elizabeth school board and I guess I would just use this opportunity to announce that we have received the resignation of school board member Richard West um, and he was a good member we'll be sorry to see him leave but um, his resignation does require a special election so I can have a motion I'll make the motion I motion that we call a special municipal election on Tuesday, June 8, 2004, concurrent with the state primary to fill a vacancy on the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Good. Any discussion? Yes, you, you might ask the town clerk <coughs> to discuss the details of when papers would be available. Oh, thank you. Hey, when there's a special election, there's a provision in Title 30A that allows a shorter period of time that nomination papers can be available for um, folks that wish to be a candidate, as well as a special provision for the time frame period that they're returned to the municipal clerk prior to the election. And I've outlined that in the first memo that I gave you that's on the front of the packet. 
Today, however, it's been brought to my attention that possibly two of the three school board candidates for the May 4th, 2004 board school election uh, are considering running for the special election as well, which has created a little bit of, okay, how do we deal with this? You mean, excuse me, you mean running in May <coughs> and in June? <laughs> yes. And there is no prohibition for these candidates uh, to keep them from running for both elections. However, if they were to win the May election, um, and then they were also on the June election, they could potentially win that, create a vacancy, and we're, we're looking at another special election. <laughs> Additionally, under Title 30A, and it's Section 2528, sub 6, there is a provision that candidates must withdraw 45 days prior to an election. They have to submit written um, a written notice to the municipal clerk, and that date is April 24th. Therefore, uh, I am recommending, in order to avoid the need to withdraw nomination papers, uh, that the town council designate that nomination papers be made available starting tomorrow until May 5th, that's one day after the um, municipal election. We should have absentee ballots printed and available for voters who want to vote absentee, I would assume the following Monday, um, which is May 10th. This will allow time for the potential candidates to circulate as well as enough time for voters who want to vote absentee. Mayor. <laughs> Council Swift Canada. I, I would say it's the lateness of the hour, but it's only 8 now, <laughs> and so I don't have a good excuse. The length of the agenda. But I'm not sure I understood that. So could people still run for... Ha Walk me through that again, please. I'm sorry. I, if, if I spoke with one school board member today who indicated there was another school board member who two of them are on May ballot. Yeah. There is nothing in the statute... Candidates, not members. Yes, they are candidates. There is nothing to prohibit these candidates from taking out nomination papers and, and I guess the unfortunate event that they are not elected this May, yes. that they could be elected in June. If the ballots are printed and their names are on the ballot, there is not enough time for them to withdraw. If the, if the May, you mean if the June ballots are printed? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, go ahead. What I am hoping is that this one or two candidates, if they decide to take out nomination papers, that they not submit them to my office. They can take them out, circulate, get their signatures, but not submit them to my office until the day after the you know, uh, May 4th election. Mm -hmm. That way, there's no need for a 45-day withdrawal mm -hmm. and no need to reprint ballots. And no that would special election. That would avoid. Well, I, I got it. Thank you. And we can. No for against me. What does this do about the absentee ballots? So the way I read your memo, it, the absentee ballots have to be available a certain period of time prior to the election. Also, mm -hmm. is that correct? the absentee ballots do not have to be available the 30 days before an election under that special provision when there's a special election that's been established. It'll be pretty close. <laughs> I think we did well in getting a uh, an educated clerk to start a first exercise, <laughs> but that wasn't what I was sort of speaking to. And I do understand what you're saying, and I assume you've spoken with those candidates, perhaps, and suggested that they hold off as well. Once I have the approval from the council, then I will speak with those two candidates. Okay, great. Then I can, I guess, one of the comments that I wanted to do originally, and that would just to obviously wish uh, Mr. West well. Um, I had never met the gentleman prior to the board and orientation meeting when uh, school board members Ray and West attended. Um, I had happened to sit down to dinner with him. I was very impressed with his, uh, his knowledge, his interest in the school, what was happening, and I'm really disappointed that uh, the somehow or other it wasn't made to work um, and well I won't go any further than that but uh, Richard wish you well and I wish you were staying on the board but um, oh. um, 
I'm not, I don't have anything at this time. Does everyone understand? And did we have a motion? We did, okay. To do what you've outlined. <laughs> All, and any, any further discussion? No. All in favor of the motion to hold to do all of this said. <laughs> as Deborah outlined. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Madam Chair, yes. I would just like to join Councillor Roberts in um, wishing Richard West well. I um, watched the school board meetings on TV and, so, and I just had run into him at a couple of finance school board finance meetings and I was very impressed with his enthusiasm for the job and um, in the short time that he was on the board, the knowledge that he um, was was sharing with the community. And um, I think he will be missed. I think he brought good ideas and enthusiasm and goodwill to the board. And I wish him very well. And I hope that he continues to be involved in the community in some way or another because he's a good, he's a good asset for people with disabilities. Thank you. I simply join in the comments expressed by both Councillor Swift-Kayata and Councillor Roberts. Likewise. Well, perhaps I should say for the Council, we all wish Richard West well because we did enjoy our brief tenure with him. And I spoke with him on the phone last Friday um, and expressed my regret that he is resigning, but encouraged him to get involved in other aspects of our town government and um, hopefully he will. Okay, the next item is, uh, where are we here? Special election 120, an action to approve the warrant for the May 4th, 2004 municipal election, an action to appoint the election warden and the deputy warden for the calendar year 2004. Does the clerk have anything to say about this? There is a memo in our package outlining the um, appointments, the times, the warrants, I'm sorry. Okay. Councilor McGinty? I move approval of the warrant for the May 4th, 2004 uh, election as presented and that the town council appoint Henry C. Adams as the election warden and Deborah Cabana as the deputy board. Okay, there's a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. I just wanted to say what a terrific job both Henry Adams and Jackie Coy have done for the town in the past in this capacity. And uh, we're looking forward to having uh, Deborah jump into that Cape Elizabeth voting now we have two voting machines, so it shouldn't be too rough next time. And the next item is the action to appoint Deborah Cabana as the Registrar of Voters, and that's item 120. Is there a motion? Uh, move. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Okay, and the next item, item 122 is an action to approve the list of election clerks as submitted by the political parties following their recent caucuses. And there is a list of names. Question on that before we move on, on if I could, and maybe Deborah could answer the question. One of them is Rebecca Millett, um, and she's running for one of the school board I seats. I actually asked Deborah that question today. Um, she obviously would not serve as a, um, clerk on the election day in which she is running, but she would be eligible to serve as a clerk on other election days where she is not running for office. Even if she were elected? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, further? I need the motion now. I know, I'll, I'll move motion. for the, the slate as recommended. Second? Second. Any further discussion? Uh, just a question. Is there no requirement that the Republicans and Democrats be equally represented? I'll defer to the clerk who tells me no. No. 
we need between four and five of each from the party. This is the list that I get to choose from when to approve it. As long as I have four or five, I'm happy. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Okay, the next item is item 123, and that is the action to approve the annual dog warrant. And there is a memo from Deborah Cabana in your folder. A motion. I will move approval of the annual dog warrant. I wonder if people need an explanation of what the dog warrant is. Deborah, would you like to? Sure. We register approximately 1,100 dogs here in the town of Cape Elizabeth, and uh, dog licenses become available October 15th of the preceding year, and they are due no later than January 31st of the following year. After January 31st, there's an automatic $10 late fee per dog. Uh, any folks that have been registering their dogs that were licensed before, after January 1st, are paying a $10 late fee. There's been several notices that have gone out to these owners, and staff has even attempted to make phone calls to these owners, advising that they need to come in and license their dog. Um, I will tell you that the town of Cape Elizabeth uh, is very generous in giving time. Um, in Brunswick, it is the first meeting on February. <laughs> this is here before the council. Uh, because at this time, uh, the folks that do not license their dogs is a $25 late fee per dog. And um, once this is signed, uh, the, the fees are set by statute. Uh, the dog owners or keepers will be assessed a regular licensing fee as well as a $25 late fee. Uh, the animal control officer will uh, be visiting them, and if they do not respond within seven days, then they are liable for a court date. Any further? Thank you, Deborah. Councilor Mould. Why is there no warrant for cats? <laughs> There's three of us now. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> All right, we're getting I'm voting, I'm voting against this warrant because there's no warrant for cats. It, that's, it's, it's state law, not local law. I know. <laughs> we have had a sec I don't believe you've had a second yet. Second. We have a second. Second. Also. Thank you. Um, I had a... Councillor McGinty. <laughs> um, how many golf laws are there? Do we know? I'm, I uh, see the list. I don't want to have to... There's an attached list that we ran off this afternoon. Many, I did not counting. count them. Uh, probably I, I about just, 140 or 50. Anybody on the count? Team? Town manager would like to speak to this, Councillor Robert. Yeah. Uh, the licensing or non-licensing of cats is a state statutory issue. It's, it's not a local issue. Uh, aside from that, there are certain ministerial responsibilities that a legislative body has in terms of enforcing its own ordinances uh, in, in seeing that they're carried out. And one of those ministerial responsibilities as contained through state law and through your local dog ordinance is to approve an annual dog warrant. Uh, if the council majority did not approve an annual dog warrant, uh, it would negate uh, your dog ordinance and you'd also be in, in violation of the state law. So while, while I understand uh, you know, that some folks may not want to do this, uh, you know, I would hope that uh, a majority of the council would recognize that it's a ministerial responsibility and one can still be against the general practice or have qualms about the general practice, but the way to address those is through changing your ordinance or seeking to change the state law and, and not uh, having protest votes against uh, you, uh, carrying out your ministerial responsibility. Councilor Roberts. In spite of what the town manager has said, I will not be voting for it for reasons I've mentioned the last two years. Um, we've also not voted to give Cumberland County their money, and we've gone ahead and done it anyway. But I have serious concerns about the, the fact that dogs have to be licensed, and it controls the rabies issue. The cats are not licensed. We don't know how many of them running around a rabbit or have the feline leukemia or all the other illnesses and diseases they carry. Uh, the, if, in our budget packet, uh, the report from the police department says that 
the major financial consideration in the budget for the uh, animal control is for cats and not for dogs. And that's because when a cat is picked up and brought to the pound, that animal cannot be, nothing can be done with them until a vet has seen them at a cost of, I think it's $70 per visit. Most dog owners call and pick up their animals. Most cat owners do not. And it costs the town a fortune to deal with it. And by, maybe if we can only get three votes on it, perhaps somebody in the paper will write it up, and maybe some legislator will get the message and we can get, uh, shed some light on the fact that there's a, a real inequity here on the cost of the town, the health factors, the environmental factors that some people are, are concerned with as well. So I'm gonna file my protest vote again this year anyway. If I thought it was truly going to fail, I would vote for it, but... Well, one never knows well, we when can always, vote should it, not the be... The winning party can always call us back no. for a revote, for reconsideration. Yes, so <laughs> we want to get the state mad at us. So frivolously. Councilor Backer. Well, I don't have quite the reaction to this that Councilor Roberts has, but... Um, I know a surprisingly large number of the dogs on this list. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> the dogs are their owners. <laughs> I'd call all of your friends the tonight. The dogs. <laughs> and I, reluctant to disparage their good name and character, is there a way that is we the can... character of the dogs or the owners? The dogs. <laughs> the dogs. Um, is there a way that we can approve this but delay the effectiveness of it for, say, 72 hours to give these uh, dogs one last opportunity to come in and pay their license without the $25? If, if the council penalty? could wish, the assistant town manager could inform you of all the activities that were done thus far in, in attempting to notify these individuals uh, that their, their dogs were due. Uh, you know, there's an extensive notification procedure, there's legal ads, there's, uh, you know, notices in the courier Did several times. Did a postcard? What, what we don't know is if some of these dogs may have, may have died and they just haven't informed us. Uh, that could, is often the case when the animal control officer visits, is we realize that the dog has passed on. And, uh, mm. so well, I should add that from my own, my own personal experience, I did receive, um, a, a, an email once from the uh, assistant town manager um, reminding me that uh, my dog had not renewed his license and I had to email her back and say thank you for your concern but he's dead mm -hmm. <laughs> and she emailed me back her condolences and I appreciated that that the town was that concerned um, however um, I still would like if there's any grace period at all possible to uh, notify a few of these dogs that I know before I impose a penalty. Right. Uh, they have had seven months or so to register their dogs. I, mean, I don't know how much more time we can give them. Um, I was going to state, though, hours. Uh, Jack made a couple of good points. Uh, I'm going to support the motion, but Jack made a couple of good points about um, diseases. And I was it yesterday or today there was an article in the newspaper about how diseases are carried through animals and you know end up you know in human uh, health problem but um, so it is not such a bad idea to have more animals you know, ready. May I propose an amendment to the motion? The amendment being that we give one last 72 hour period before implementation of the Who made the motion? motion. Who made the motion? I seconded it, I know that. Who made the motion? Carol did originally. Councillor Fritz made the motion. Would you accept that as a friendly amendment or should we vote? No, I'll no, okay. accept it. So we'll vote on the... If I might, once the demand is made, you are here, this, the warrant reads, you're hereby, you're also hereby to make a demand on the, the owner or keeper to obtain a license from the municipal clerk within seven days from the date of the demand and return to the clerk the license and recording please plus a late fee of $25 per dog license. You know, we're not about to arrest anyone. Uh, you know, if you look up, up above, uh, you know, this is only the notice. It's, it's only after, uh, you know, we only filed the complaint with the court, you know, after they haven't responded within seven days. They've already gone failing to register their dogs since 
January 1? Is that the date? As I understand it, you're saying they have seven days grace once, period. Once they get the once notice from the animal control it. officer, they have seven days. Would you like to withdraw your... No, your amendment wasn't accepted, so... I move Would you like to withdraw your amendment, though? Well, I was making it on behalf of Councillor Backer, so I'm not withdrawing it yet. I think we should vote on it. The, as it's written, the $25 fine is imposed immediately. They don't have a seven-day grace period. If the council desired, you could table this to be a Wednesday night meeting. <laughs> I think this conversation wow. is not is uh, does not, no. <clears throat> hope that does not happen. We'll okay, I... The poor school board is going to sit through us talking about dogs. I suggest we vote on the amendment right now. The amendment being the grace period. All in favor of a grace was, period. Was the amendment, do you have to second an amendment? Mm -hmm. Was yeah, there a okay, second? There was no amendment? second. Of I seconded. Okay. <laughs> okay. All in favor of the amended amendment, which would provide for a grace period. 72 hours, right? Two. In favor. Councillor Moles and Councillor Dack are opposed. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. All in favor of the motion to accept the dog warrant. One, two, three, four, five, six. Opposed? Councillor Roberts. Okay. Next item is item 124, and th that is action upon a recommendation from the Appointments Committee to fill a vacancy on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Councillor Fritz, do you have anything? Yes, um, Chairman of the Appointments Committee. Just that we had several very good candidates come forward uh, with interest in serving on the Zoning Board of Appeals, and um, we can't have everyone, so um, we encourage those people who were not selected to to return again to uh, serve on another committee of their interest. Um, so I will move that the uh, the town council accept the recommendation of the appointment of uh, Leonard Galino uh, to serve on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Second. Uh, and his, he is filling an unexpired term that runs through December 31st, 2004. Second. Any discussion? Councillor Mauls? As Councillor Fritz just said, we had two excellent candidates apply for this position. It, it was really difficult for the Appointments Committee to, to pick between them. So the candidate that we did not choose, please don't, you know, read anything into that. We, we would encourage you to apply again for this position as it opens up or another position with another board. Um, again, we're blessed in this town to have such great volunteers for all our boards. Okay. Thank you. All in favor of the appointment? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. The next item um, is item... Madam Chair, may I just mention um, that we again have a vacancy on the Recycling Committee. So uh, there will be a notice um, of that vacancy and you can apply online um, at this moment um, <laughs> at capeelizabeth.com. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Fritz. Next item is item 125, which is action upon a report from the town manager regarding consolidating public safety dispatching with the city of South Portland. And there is a memo from Michael McGovern in your package. Um, recommending that we not consolidate dispatching, um, that to do so would save the average taxpayer $8.37 per year or less than two-tenths of 1% 1 of the estimated average tax bill of $4,200. So is there a motion? Councillor yes. swift -Piotta. Um, uh, I move that we, that the council accept the recommendation from the police chief, fire chief, and town manager to uh, not consolidate. Is there a second? Thank you. Okay. Any discussion? 
Councilman McGinty. I just had one question, I, and I didn't bring my whole packet on this. Um, what what jeopardy are we in of the PSAP? I think you reported that we're at the very bottom of the list, and the state. I mean, do we have any information where we might stand on being forced to lose that? We don't. I, I think we. You know, I debated addressing it in the report, and my my view is we ought to take a wait and see attitude. South Portland has offered to provide the service for us, and they've offered to provide the service for us for nine thousand dollars if the state should push us in some direction. Since the PSAP is, you know, an, an infinitesimal amount of the overall work of the dispatchers, it, it's my feeling that we, we can continue to hand, handle that just fine ourselves, and, and why incur an expense of $9,000 that we don't need to incur? Uh, the county is also looking at a study. We can be looking at that, and the PUC is continuing to look at the issue. My, my sense is we're, we're best served by waiting to see where, where they push us, because it's only going to cost us more money uh, if South Portland does it or if the county does it and needs to add staff to do it. Because all a PSAP does is answer the phone, take the call, and transfer the call somewhere else. It's just a, another layer of bureaucracy uh, that, that increases cost. And I think it's unfortunate the way uh, the state has bandied about this issue of some sort of a cost savings uh, when, when it might save a few state tax dollars. But in the end, it's going to save it's going to cost municipalities and property taxpayers more money. Councilor Sosiata, um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to um, I, I left one small part off of my motion. Um, I recommended that we I moved that we accept the recommendation and not consolidate. And I would like to add to it and retain the local dispatch center in KPS. Councilor Roberts. I would like to take the opportunity to thank our staff and South Portland uh, staff. Uh, they put a considerable amount of time into the study, researching it, and even though the conclusion wasn't to consolidate, um, it was a great effort made, and, and both need to be thanked for that time and effort. Well, I was going to basically say the same thing. I think it's an exercise that's worth going through, um, and that I mean, our dispatchers do a great deal more than just wait for a call for fire or ambulance. I mean, they're doing all the department records, and um, because there's no clerical work um, being done by any of the police, you know, they do the records of keeping for the department. So um, uh, I, I think it was a good exercise, and I think we should look to other things. To, to consider working with other communities, whether or not we join with them would be another thing. Yes, for the viewing public, uh, would the town manager let them know what PSAP stands for? Public Safety Answering Point. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor of the motion to accept the town manager's report. And, rec and, rec and recommendation and recommendation. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the next item is item 126, action upon a report from the town manager recommending that a workshop agenda item be scheduled at a later date on the possible sale of certain town-owned land. We had looked at a list of town-owned land, I believe, earlier this year, and ask the manager and the planning department and others um, to take a harder look at that list to see if there was any property appropriate for sale. There is a report in your package and the manager suggests that we set this for workshop. Is there a motion? I would motion that we set the action on what to do with town-owned land to a workshop at a uh, later date. Second. Second. Any discussion? I would just like to say that. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to go ahead? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Councilor Mull, go ahead. I, did. Well, I, didn't, I didn't mean to. No, no, go ahead. I've gone out and I've looked at every single property on the list, and there are some that are obviously wet. There are some that are uh, pump stations for uh, the sewer system, but there are some good properties on there that could be. Uh, utilized to bring in some 
revenues to the town down the road or some, some other function for the town. So uh, I would encourage uh, the councilors and any of the viewing public to, to go out and look at some of these properties and come back to us with what they think the best use is for some of these properties. In light of the manager's recommendation in this memo to, that each council member visit each site, I have a good, I can find them all on the map. Um, mm. Some of them I might have trouble finding in real life because there aren't any nearby houses or anything. And I Monument. would ask that if there's some way, we, I don't know, I, I don't want to make a big dog and pony show out of this, but if there's a tour, if we could find out from the planner or somebody where some of these are. Um, and we won't make a dog and pony, we'll make a cat and pony show. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. I have so you're, pony. you're willing to <laughs> accommodate Oh yeah, we'll, sure, okay. yeah. we'll I, I, would, I would like to go see them, but some of them, I know, because I remember going around with Councillor Roberts when we were looking at minimum lot size, and we looked at probably 40 different lots, and sometimes we weren't sure, riding around in, in his truck, if we were looking at the right lot, because there isn't a sign that says, this is lot, you know, UB1342. It would be a good thing for the assessor to, to uh, help us. Well, well you, you will make sure that a tour gets scheduled and if there are three or more counselors it will be properly noticed mm -hmm. it's a public meeting i trust yeah. councillor roberts just a i guess a comment and i'm sure it's probably part of the policy but i know the letter that we got um, asking for a piece of land there is another private abutter as well and i assume that both abutters would be given an opportunity if that was for sale and there and, and elsewhere and that particular piece of land is landlocked you have to cross private property to get to it or come in through the wetlands through the back of the high school so if anybody wants to put on their boots i can show them where it is in, in all these cases but if it gets to that point we would know to fight all the others because they're the most likely buyers okay so all in favor of setting this up for a workshop seven zero Okay, item 128. Any idea how far out that workshop will be? We're we looking at June at this point. I don't think we're looking at June. There will probably be May, but we'll discuss that May. offline. Yeah, well, I, mean, I just don't know right now. Um, item 128, action upon a recommendation from the Ordinance Committee recommending that no action be taken regarding a citizen request to regulate Think, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I crossed, thank you. Crossed that off already. Action upon a recommendation emanating from a council workshop regarding the possible installation of a traffic signal and other improvements at the entrance road to Cape Elizabeth High School. How could I miss something so <laughs> near and dear to my heart? Road safety. Road safety. So there is a draft motion in our package which essentially provides that um, the council approves um, an application to tax, which would, we hope, fund 80% of traffic light. And um, if the project is not approved, the cost of the traffic light, light and other improvements would be bonded as an amendment to the school bond should there um, be not enough money within the existing project. If there is enough money within the existing project, and this um, resolution provides that there will be a discussion and a recommendation from the school building committee on how to fund the light. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Well, what kind of time frame is the PACS um, process? Is it like a two, three? Yeah. We'll, we'll get a preliminary indication the next couple of months, and then we'll know for sure in October, Bob? About October, and the council would, well, and, and I'll say it because there's a couple of other later items in the agenda, that the council, you know, if you submitted any now, you know, the preliminary look at you would need to vote again on all of, on any or all of these in October. To to accept the money. Mm -hmm. To to or continue with the process. Okay. Any further council Um, I I'm intending to vote against this. Um. I really don't think a traffic light is necessary at the entrance to the high school. 
Um, I don't think the traffic, um, the, the accident rate comes up to the standard of the usual um, need for a traffic light. Uh, I thought it was very interesting in the report that, w that the traffic engineer that was hired to analyze the traffic for the community center, so that was in 2001, said that of the, because there is an, considered an F condition that's there, which means there are delays of greater than 50 seconds, and that's considered a difficult area. However, in that study in 2001, um, that F condition occurred in the morning from 7.18 to 7.27 in the morning, which was nine minutes, and affected 36 vehicles. Uh, in the evening, or, a, or the afternoon really, it occurred sporadically, that F condition, from 2.04 to 2.11. Uh, which was over eight minutes, and affected 17 vehicles. So I, I realize we may have some more traffic now, but I don't think we have that much more traffic that this warrants a traffic light. I think we will have longer delays um, when there is a traffic light. I think people are not going to be happy with the delays. Uh, I think, and this is, I'm sure, something people don't like to hear, but I think more students should be riding the buses that we provide and pay for. And I think we don't need to drop our students off, parents, at the, at, right at the door, so they don't need to go all the way in and back out. I think we should improve the pavement and the turning uh, left turn lane. Um, and something I might suggest is maybe we should just ban left turns out of the high school lot um, at a certain time, and people would have to come out and around, and um, I think that could very well work. Councilor Roberts. Thank you. I know that there are a couple of uh, planning board members are here this evening, so I had uh, indicated earlier that I would support looking for the funding but a traffic light was not my first way of solving the problem either. I would hope that somebody might come up with some other suggestions on how to deal with that issue. I did not want to see the high school renovation held up because we don't have the funds for light, and if that's what's determined that it has to be. Um, I have concerns about uh, the law of unintended consequences. Have, I'm not sure that's been fully uh, solved to my satisfaction that Fowler Road wouldn't need a light down the road. I know that they have a similar problem over on Scott Dyer Road with the parents dropping their kids off there. So if we get a light over in this location, how long before they come tripping in and want a, want a light on Scott Dyer Road? Um, we, the, the town depends heavily on volunteers responding to fire and rescue calls. They cannot go through red lights. And granted, it may only be a 30 second or a 45 second delay in somebody getting through that light, but if you're on the other end waiting for them to respond, that can seem like an eternity. Um, so for all of those reasons, um, yes, I'll support the request, but I hope that the planning board doesn't look at that as a mandate for a light. I would prefer to see it done else some, in some other fashion. Yes, as a um, resident of Cape Elizabeth and as a parent, I have four children in the school system. Uh, one in high school, one going to high school. I go to a lot of events at the high school, and it is very difficult to get in and out of the high school at, at certain times. Uh, and that, you know, seems to be increasing. Uh, as far as dropping students off, it, it is appropriate to drop them off close to the school. Uh, you wouldn't want to drop them off at the IGA parking lot. You don't want to drop them off at 77. That would create other problems in those areas. Uh, I do support traffic light. Uh, as far as issues with Fowler Road, uh, part of the proposal down the road is to create a turning lane, which would create a larger capacity to hold cars there at the light, which would help alleviate part of that problem. Um, 
and I, from, my, from my, my understanding that this would not in any way slow down the school renovation process. That's correct. If, yes, go ahead. Then you ask anything. If the town council did not approve this, it could very well slow down the process because it is, there is still a level of service F that the planning board needs to consider and they'll be left without a solution. I'm not going to support this for a couple of reasons. Mostly what um, uh, Carol said, I don't think that the, the schools have tried to mitigate the problem sufficiently enough. I don't think they've tried to mitigate, mitigate it at all. In fact, they're adding parking spaces, you know, and you build it and they will come. Um, and also, I think that if, if we should get the funding, I think that's tantamount to saying we're going to build it. And I know it didn't happen last time we got some funding for this, but I think it just adds to the um, momentum to try to put these signals in. So I'm not going to be supporting um, this motion. All right, Councilor Seattle. I will be supporting this motion um, at the, I believe it was a workshop that we had on um, this issue for uh, members of the school board separately set up because they had not had a chance to vote as a body on it, but four of them individually got up and expressed their support for this solution, a traffic light and turning lane, this solution to the traffic problems that they have been very concerned about and have had a lot of concern about from parents. Um, over the past few years. Um, I am very concerned that, first of all, I, I, I think that their concern is merited. Um, I think there are some safety issues there. I know it's not been a, a great, a big crash site, but I think there are some safety issues there. I, my major concern with the site is financial, and that's why I'd like to see us um, apply for some money, Fed money, or tax money, or any money that we can get to um, on this. And um, the way the light would work, is, as I understand it, is that it would only be operational in that it, there would only be red light for some, a period in the morning and then a period in the afternoon, and perhaps when there were special events there that would facilitate the flow of traffic. I do not want to slow down the school project. And if they do not, if they cannot present this solution to the planning board, I think it will slow down the school project, and uh, I think it's vital that it continue. So I will be supporting. It. I, I will also be supporting it. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in whether we need a light or we don't need a light, but both the town and the school have hired traffic engineers and have um, completed studies on the issue. And every engineer that has looked at that traffic intersection has concluded that there needs to be a light and a turn lane. And in fact, there are two afternoon peaks. There's a peak at between two and three, and there's another peak between five and six. The population of the high school has increased substantially in the last um, couple of years, and we're adding another, I think, 30 uh, some odd number next year. Um, I think it's, um, we're just not going to turn back the clock in terms of saying more kids should um, take the bus. In fact, the superintendent was concerned that if there was a rule that more kids took the bus or there was a rule that kids couldn't park at the school, that in fact there would be even more drivers because the parents would be coming in and out dropping the kids off. So um, I certainly will be supporting this. Um, it's both uh, reasonable in terms of the uh, clear and express advice that we've had from traffic experts. And uh, I just go back to, I think it's the right thing to do. It, we, it's an accident waiting to happen. And I, for one, um, want to be able to say that we follow the advice of the experts in the field. So I would be supporting it. Councilor Swift Gowder. I would move the question. Could I just make one more comment before we do that? It, you know, we keep talking about this level F of service, and their own report says the satisfaction of a traffic signal warrant or warrant shall not in itself require the installation of the traffic control. So and if I could address that, I asked that, very same, I asked that very same question to the 
the gentleman who, who had, the engineer who had put that together, because I too was concerned about that comment, and he said in his professional opinion that it was warranted, um, and so he is the expert. And I've n I have not been a big proponent of traffic lights, but I have been convinced on this one, especially since with the new high schoolers moving in, they will all be arriving at the same moment. When the kindergarten is pulled out of that high school, the kindergartners showed up at different times and left at different times than the high schoolers. So the high school, the, the new high school population, increased population, will all be coming and going at the same moment. So, but I would like to move the question, please. Thank you. Owen Thaler of the um, resolution as drafted by the town manager in our package. One, two, three, four, five. Opposed? Councillor McGinty and Fred. Yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify. I didn't want to get involved in the debate, but sometimes things are said during debates that three years from now you hear, well, it was said at the meeting, such and such. And I, I just want to be sometimes only a week later. I want to make clear that we will be presenting this to the planning board as the recommended solution. Uh, we, the town of Cape Elizabeth is the applicant. Uh, we have consultants, Pinkham and Greer, who are working through the school department for this, and this will be the recommended alternative that we're presenting to the planning board, and we will be defending it as such. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I, Councillor Swift Kayata said that the light would only be operational a little bit, and I, I want to make sure that comment wasn't misinterpreted by anyone. The, the, you, you, traffic lights, when they go in, you don't have them on for just an hour and turn them off. It will, in fact, be operational from about 6.30 in the morning to probably 10 at night. However, it will be green on Route 77, you know, 95% of the time, and it'll be tend to be, you know, during the busier times when things are coming out the high school that you have it cycling. But it will, in fact, be operational throughout that period, even though it'll be mostly green on Route 77 during the, the times when there isn't traffic coming out. I, Stand corrected. You, that was my understanding, yep. but I didn't express it very well. You, you explained it a lot better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just a question about that. Why could it not be only for an hour in the morning? I, I think we need to move on to the next item, Councilor Fritz. We've had the vote, and we've got a, we still have a long list of things ahead of us tonight. So um, I would suggest you just ask Michael that after the meeting. Item 128 is an action upon a recommendation from the Ordinance Committee recommending that no action be taken regarding a citizen request to regulate certain activities by commercial vehicles in residential neighborhoods. And there is a memo in your package from the Ordinance Committee. Is there anyone from the Ordinance Committee who would like to speak to this? The Ordinance Committee would be happy to speak to this. Um, the Ordinance Committee uh, Councillors McGinty, Swift, Kayata, and I met twice um, about this. This was prompted by a complaint that um, the town received from um, one resident who was complaining that uh, another resident in the neighborhood um, was running the tractor of a tractor trailer rig in the driveway, letting the diesel engine run uh, for longer than the complaining party thought was necessary um, and thought that there was a noise violation that should be addressed by the town. And it raised a couple of questions to the Ordinance Committee, one of which was whether or not the town should consider prohibiting the ability to park large trucks or a tractor or tractor trailer rig on any town street, and also whether or not there should be some enactment of a noise ordinance. We considered both of those. We met with uh, the town planner, Maureen O'Meara. We met with the chief of police, uh, Neil Williams. Uh, they both weighed in on the issues. And ultimately, after considering all the options, including looking at ordinances from other towns, uh, the ordinance committee decided that uh, we should enact no new ordinances, that the uh, ordinance addressing noise and disturbing to the peace were sufficient to address any concerns that neighbors might have. Uh, Chief Williams uh, satisfied the ordinance committee that the uh, laws currently in place were sufficient 
to address any concerns that we had. Um, and we decided that it was just unnecessary to try and enact an ordinance that would prohibit trucks of any specific size. And the recommendation that you have in front of you um, is a summary um, of those recommendations. Would you like to move that the council accept the report? So moved. Any further, any discussion? All in favor of accepting the report of the ordinance committee? One, two, three, four, five. The report and recommendation. Seven, zero. And if I could just add, I know this is something that we hear that is stated a lot, but you know, once again, I'm, I, I never cease to be uh, impressed with the knowledge of all of the staff members in town and the heads of the various departments, their willingness to answer questions, to collect information, um, and how knowledgeable they are about an incredible array of subjects. And in this case, uh, Chief Williams, um, our town planner, uh, Maureen O'Meara, uh, they were both as patient as could be um, in addressing all the questions we had, um, and they proved uh, once again that they are the right people uh, for the positions that they hold. So I thank both of them for their help. Thank you, David. And the next item is item 129, action to refer to the planning board a request to amend the zoning ordinance to provide that undeveloped space on a subdivision plan could be designated as being for future development. And there is a letter from the lawyer, uh, I'm sorry, there's a letter from uh, John Mitchell representing uh, Steve Bothell, Pat Bothell, and Robert Bothell in your package. Councilor Backer, I understand you have a recusal issue. Um, well, it's not so much an issue, but I am recusing myself um, from any discussion on this matter um, because I represent the applicant um, in legal matters related to um, this requested zoning ordinance amendment. Okay. I, I will move to accept the recusal. Councilor Backer. Second. 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 Any further discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Councilor Backer, normally the councilor leaves the podium for the discussion. It may be brief, but thank you. Don't go too far. Don't go too far. Um, and again, a motion to refer to the planning board would be in order. Councilor Moll. Prior to making that motion, oh, okay. Why don't you make the motion? I'll, I'll make the motion. Discuss it. I would like to make a motion that we refer this request to view. Request to amend land, the zoning ordinance. A request to amend the zoning ordinance for land in an RB district as future development. Uh, to the planning board. Second. Okay, now discussion, Councilor Mullins. Um, I was actually going to send it to workshop, but. Okay, Councilor Frick. If you want to just send it to the planning board, that's fine. I'd just like to come, um, I'm going to vote against it because when I was on the planning board, I realized that this. I think this was enacted when I was on the planning board. It's very important for the planning board to be able to consider to consider a whole piece of land when they're considering approval. I mean, there might be drainage issues, open space issues. There's a lot of, they don't have to designate exactly where the road will be or how the development will be but they need to have be able to consider factors that that affect the lay of the land and, and important drainage and, and other issues so i think it's a very important consideration for the planning board and i would not favor changing the ordinance as it currently is councillor roberts i didn't really 
understand this at all when I was reading it, and I noticed the town planner is here. Would it be appropriate to ask Maureen if she could give us some kind of background on how this works or what sure, we're sure. actually looking at? Maureen? Yeah. Well, she's coming forward. Could you also explain the amendment process of if someone proposes a, an amendment to the zoning ordinance? Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Councillor Fritz's comment that it's important for the planning board to have a good idea of what's going on, even though you don't have to specifically lay it out. That's that's exactly true. The problem is that uh, this particular in in there's our there are portions in town called the RB districts, and if you want to do a subdivision in the RB district, you must comply with the open space zoning standards, which is a good. Thing. However, one of the open space zoning standards is that you have to comply not only with a minimum lot size, but also also with an average lot size. In order to comply with an average lot size, you do have to do final design of your land. You can't show that you can comply with it otherwise. And that's the situation we're trying to deal with here. We have a property owner in the RV district who is trying to be responsible and do some estate planning. They have already multiple buildings on their property. and they have divided one lot off. If they go one more, they have triggered subdivision review. Uh, it's actually in their best interest to do a cluster development. I think it would be a better use of the property. However, they own a large piece, and it would force them to do a full subdivision design of their property when, in fact, all they want to do right now is organize their estate for the buildings that are already there. And what this would do is allow them to meet all of the RB zoning requirements for the lots they're creating and set aside the rest of the land by also providing the planning board with sufficient information to show that when they come back in the future, they would be able to comply with the RB standards. Uh, it would give them a little bit more wiggle room in terms of actually having to do final design. If they don't spend the money to do final design, they don't have to actually develop the land right now. So if the council sees fit to refer this to the planning board, what I would be doing is recommending that the ordinance be amended to allow this flexibility as long as we also had provisions in there that talked about giving the board enough information to demonstrate that you can meet these standards when you do final design. So that's what this amendment is about, and I understand that without all that background, it's going to be kind of hard to figure out what <laughs> is being asked. And, and Maureen, it would come back to the council? Absolutely. For the final yeah, the amendment process, I mean, it's actually a, it's, it's a good step to start with the council, because if you're asked to do something that you know right at the beginning you're never going to approve, why have the planning board spend time on it while get all the neighbors riled up about it? So. It's kind of a starting point with the council. You send it to the planning board. The planning board spends some time writing something up. They have to hold a public hearing. After they hold their public hearing, they send it to the council. The council takes the time it needs to review, and then you have to hold a public hearing as well. So that's the process. But the council cannot act upon any amendment to the zoning ordinance without first referring it to the planning board as well. Correct. According to the zoning ordinance. You, you're required, the planning board has a limit of 45 days, so technically after 45 days you could grab it back. I don't think you've ever done that, but you can't just unilaterally work on it without sending it to the board first. Councilor Robert, that you have satisfied my concerns. Okay. I'm just wondering if this sort of, if this sort of amendment is attempting to fit a particular situation but might not be good for that seems like a appropriate way to deal with developments and this might be tailoring it too much and then that's a legitimate concern uh, i would point out that in other districts other than the rb district you would already be allowed to do this and in fact we have for example the blueberry ridge project is an example of where a portion of the land was proposed for development and the rest of the land was set aside for future development and labeled such and then came back later on. So I see all this is doing is restoring to the people in the RB district that little bit that all the other people in town can already do. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five. And opposed? Councillor Fritz. 
Okay. Next item is item 130, which is also um, action to refer to the planning board a request to amend the zoning ordinance to provide that mixed use develop mixed use development may occur in the business district A. That is B A the B A zone. And again, there is a letter in your package from uh, Jensen Baird representing uh, his clients, Joel and Kelly Fitzpatrick. Mr. Fitzpatrick, okay. Councillor Roberts. Um, I would uh, make the motion that to accept this re um, Actually, I guess uh, as, as it was read, a motion to refer to the planning board a request to amend the zoning ordinance. That's, that's Is that what you want to so do? Moved. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Second. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Councilor Roberts. I was going to again ask Maureen if she could explain this one for us as well. She did such an eloquent job on the previous one. I'll try to be a little briefer. Uh, I think most people are familiar with the, with the town center zoning. And I'm gonna, it'll make sense in a minute while I'm bringing that up. But the town center zoning was written in 1995. I think the town was uh, doing all the best current thinking about mixed-use buildings and apartments and retail being in the same building. And what happened is that we changed, we wrote the town center zoning, and I think we've since seen that that may work just fine. We never went back and changed any other zoning. So we have this business A district that really is at best hostile to apartments and mixed use buildings to the point where if you look in the rest of the zoning ordinance, every time it talks about a multifamily unit, they really are contemplating a condominium. And if you think about the kind of developments that look like condominiums and compare them to apartments, they don't mesh very well. So I think what we really need to do with this request is to go through the ordinance and make sure that we have dealt with apartments in an appropriate manner and separate them out from the standards that we're currently using for condominiums. Maureen, I just have a question. Um, I don't know if you have a zoning map around, but um, the district, a, business district A zone, if you can refresh my memory sure, and I where that is. Sure, and I a small version of the zoning map that I can show you. Is that the Crescent Beach Inn? No, the area? business A district is pretty much the good table area. Okay. It's also the area where the cookie jar is. Okay. Oh, food and references. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's been moved and seconded and Councilor Moe. From my reading of the letter, Bruce Smith says that this that current use would be a violation of the ordinance. Um, although you know, I have great respect for the Fitzpatrick's and the, the good construction projects they do around town. I'm not of the current mind to, to change that ordinance. Any further discussion? Okay, it's been moved and seconded to refer the request to change the ordinance to the planning board. And I would remind everyone it would come back to the council for final approval. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five. Are you up or down, Karen? Okay. Five in favor, <laughs> opposed? Councillor Fitzmaul, opposed. Okay, item 131 is an action on the recommendation from the Riverside Cemetery's trustees to adjust the fees. And, um, Deborah, are we hearing from you on this one? No. Are we hearing? I can Bob? do it. Okay. Unless Bobby wants to. Robert, you want to talk about Riverside Cemetery, please? I suppose I could just read them. The proposal is to increase burial fees from $425 to 500 for adults. 275 to 350 for cremains and $50 extra for Saturdays and holidays and an increase in the lots from 500 to 600 
for an adult. Does that mean there's a cheaper lot for a child? Kids ride free. <laughs> I have a question about that. And then 200 to 275 foot per main. That would be for a full size plot. So you for can get a smaller lot. Okay. Is there any questions of Bob on the increase in fees? Just, just the one. Do we have child rates? No, that's just the plot itself, the size of the plot, and there's a cream plot, which is a certain size and a full size lot. There's only two lot sizes. Okay. Which is well, physically different size. How about the burial? The burial. It says for adults. Yeah. Right. There is no thing. It's the same. Strange language, okay. And this is uh, Jesse Timberlake's also here. Yes. You're the chairman now? No. Member of the trustees. Yes. Thank you for your efforts on behalf of the town and the cemetery. Appreciate it. Any discussion? Councilor Swift Canada. Did we make a motion yet? No, no. No, no. like to their motion. motion. I'd okay. like to make uh, to move that we accept the following. The fees just as read for the 2004 burial season. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Councillor Roberts. In my day job, I actually wind up paying a number of these fees, and this is still a very good fee for the town residents. We're, we're certainly not gouging anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Okay, the next item is item 132, and that is an action on a recommendation from the Riverside Cemetery trustees to close the cemetery for burials on Labor Day and Thanksgiving Day. And I guess that's self-explanatory. There is a memo in your package. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. Okay, item 133 is action upon a recommendation from the Public Works Director to request PAC to review for possible funding the installation of a traffic signal at Route 77 Scott Dyer Road and Shore Road. And Thank you. yes, you may. I'd, I'd like to spend a few moments on this because you know, I, I know the tendency is to disapprove traffic lights. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the council got a copy of this, this traffic study back, uh, it, was, well, it was dated December 30th, so probably got in early January. Th this does a number of things. This particular intersection has a number of level of service F uh, components to it. One is the left turn out of Scott Dyer Road. Another one is the left turn out of the Shore Road. It also, it, that intersection is not at all pedestrian friendly. Uh, it, it has these huge turning radiuses. Elderly individuals have extreme difficulty getting across the road. It is not at all in keeping with the town center plan as a result. Uh, the traffic islands are in the wrong places. If, if, you, if one look back at the plan in this traffic report, what it really does, it tightens up the intersection considerably so, so that uh, the pedestrians only have you know, really two, two narrow lanes to cross instead of the, these wide turning radius areas and the others. It would do away with the, the existing islands, which are uh, not pretty and only add a whole lot of pavement, uh, but it really would make the intersection a lot more pedestrian friendly, particularly as we see a growing elderly population, as we see more insurance offices, doctor's offices, uh, the, the building next door and the like, you know, here in the town center. Uh, your action this evening would uh, authorize the application to PAX, the approximate project cost, including all of the uh, landscape improvements, the uh, the new, you know, the sidewalk enhancements as well as the light uh, in 2006 dollars is uh, $290,000.
in, you know, it's less than that uh, today, but, uh, you know, it is a result of, of the council goal to look at the traffic in the town center, to look at traffic safety in the town center, and it actually has a higher demand in terms of uh, traffic rating for the level of service or, or worse rating than, than the high school intersection. Uh, again, as I indicated earlier, that you would have to vote on this again uh, in October. We have no sense that this will be funded. It, you know, both of these are going to be very competitive, but you know, we think it, it's worthwhile uh, for the uh, pedestrian improvements that, that would occur at this intersection now that is, uh, is very deficient in terms of uh, engineering for pedestrian use. Councilor Frick. Um, which configuration? There were several alternatives. Um, I don't recall that we've had any discussion of any of those alternatives and what, you know, what might work. What you say is true. Uh, I had thought you were going to discuss this at the March 18th workshop, but you, you got involved with cell towers and high school intersections, and while it was the intent to discuss it that evening, the council had very little discussion on it. We do face, though, a deadline of tax of April, April 16th. Councilor Roberts. I am supportive of this one. I have thought that that's been a problem for a number of years, particularly with a number of tourists coming out of Shore Road. Uh, you have the gas station near Cumberland Farms. You have the real estate, the bank, the little building that's just down this way on the other side, the apartment house, all within, oh, it must, can't be much more than 200 feet. And I know that in the past, I've been coming off Shore Road, been backed up to the doctor's office, and like so many other people, zip down through the town hall, want to get out of there and avoid the people waiting for that green light when I know very well there's not one there for them. And that one, to me, is a m much bigger issue than the one down below. I still have the concern about the public safety people trying to get through there, but I don't know how we're going to deal with that one. That's an issue down the road, I guess. Councilor McGinty. I'm not going to be supporting this. Surprise, surprise. You know, I, I have a big concern. We've already mentioned Fowler Road, the intersection of Fowler Road and uh, Old Ocean House Road. Um, you know, people are going to have problems making left turns out of there. when. The middle school in Pond Cove let out in the afternoon. Uh, people come down Hill Way. They have trouble making a left turn getting on the 77 from there. They start packing up there. I mean, we're potentially going to have four signals within a mile. And, you know, the fire chief's not here to defend himself, but he would love to have one at Jordan Way when the police and fire engines have to get out of Jordan Way. Um, so. I mean, there's potential for five traffic signals within a mile. I don't think people are going to like it when they see it. Mm -hmm. um, I will be supporting it, um, and I don't know where you where you get the five signals. The traffic report that was done had two signals: one outside the high school, one uh, one at um, Shore Road and Scott Dyer Road. So there are only two signals. Um, I agree completely with Councillor Roberts. This intersection was studied as long ago as 1990 and concluded it was a failure. Um, there's hardly an intersection in Cumberland County that has more curb cuts in the immediate intersection and is as off kilter as that one. Um, and finally, I've actually heard from a, a number of people who have said they would allow their children to walk to school or ride their bikes to school if there was a light and a safe way for their children to get across Shore Road. So I think it um, may have the effect of getting more kids and adults out of their uh, cars. And finally, um, I think no matter what configuration the town were to choose among those that were in the report, they would all contribute to having more of a small town center feel because it will, as um, Michael McGovern said, tighten up the intersection and force traffic to slow down as it goes through the center of town. So I will be supporting this. Councilor Mark, would you want? Well, I'm struggling with this one because I support the traffic light in front of the high school 
multitude of safety reasons, as well as the access in and out of the high school. I've seen those buses almost get hit a number of times coming in and out of the high school. And that, you know, that's the main reason I support the traffic light in front of the high school. And, uh, you know, it is an opportune time to fix it while we are fixing the rest of the road work in and out of the high school as part of the school renovation project. And I'd like to see that get bonded into that project. Um, I'm really concerned about the expense. Even though the expense is defrayed, if we get the tax, You know, I just, I'm having a hard time with that one. I need, I need some more input on what the other counselors think about that intersection. To me, that intersection isn't as big a problem as the high school is, uh, irregardless of what the traffic studies might, might show. I've never had a problem getting in and out of that intersection. I work here in town. I go in and out of it all the time. And I just, you know, in, in a year of tight budgets, and I know budgets are going to be tight, for many years to come, I'm just concerned about spending that kind of money on, on it. Councilor Spurs-Teada. I will not be supporting um, this. Uh, I want to wait and see the impact of the light at the high school, which I do um, support. I think, as, as I recall from our workshop with the engineer um, that night, I asked him a, a question. Oh, no, I think it was Councilor Roberts asked a question about Fowler Road. Would there be gaps in traffic that the high school might help Fowler Road, that intersection? And then I asked him about the intersection of the town center, and he said that gaps provided at busy times of the day by the high school light could provide gaps in traffic that would facilitate movement through of traffic through the intersection of the town center light. So um, I would rather focus our efforts, our PACS efforts on the two projects. Um, listed below on this memo, one we've already dealt with, which is the high school light, and the other one is the Spurwink Avenue project. I would like to see what happens real life with the traffic light at the high school to see what that does, because Councilor Roberts mentioned the law of unintended consequences, and I think it may, the high school light may well help our situation in the town center, and I would be afraid of putting two lights in at the same time, because I think it may boost things up worse. So I will not be supporting it. And, and also, the council did not discuss it in detail. As, as it does say in this memo, it says it was discussed in the town council no, workshop. That's, that's, that's absolutely correct. It was not discussed. It was not really, discussed. In, I would say it was not discussed. It was barely mentioned. Only, only as it, it just we ran out of time that night. Yes, and it, I mean, for good reasons. There were many other things that were more pressing that night. But um, for all those reasons, I will not be supporting is the is, is the support of this merely um, approving the authorization to apply for tax funding, or is approval of this approval of the actual installation of a light at this intersection if funding is available? For you, Madam Chair, you'd have to vote again in October to commit this again. This is merely to have it run through the process and. See, see how it turns out. Uh, they, they go through a whole involved rating system, and you'll be voting again in October. If um, tax funding were made available um, after the council voted tonight to authorize the application for funding, and we then did not approve the use of the funds for the installation of a light, does that put Cape Elizabeth in a compromising situation with tax or in any other way jeopardize our ability to go back for funding in the future if we don't accept money that they make available? Uh, I, you know, PAX respects the town of Cape Elizabeth and understands the council's ability to decide what they want to do and what they don't want to do. Uh, Bob is going to be the chairman of the technical committee of PAX on July 1. I'm going to be the chairman of PACS, effective July 1. So I, I think our, our feeling about Cape Elizabeth will, will probably relate to other things and not, not to this. Uh, if Cape Elizabeth turned down the money, most of the other communities would celebrate uh, because that's more money that's available to them. So it's not black money? No. Okay. Councilor Mosley, 
just want to, oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Beck, I do have to. Well, it just, it, that being said, I'm, it, when I read this as part of our packet, um, I was surprised to see that there was any discussion of a light at the Shore Road uh, 77 Scott Dyer intersection. Um, I, I was really puzzled by why it was even included in here because it hadn't been discussed in any detail. Um, I'm not prepared to, to support the installation of light at that intersection. I am willing to authorize the application for funds with the understanding that there's going to be further discussion, pros and cons of whether there should be a light there. Um, so I want to make it clear that although I'm willing to support the authoriz authorization for the application, I do not intend by that to indicate that I'm willing to support the installation of a light at that intersection at this time. I, I want to just respond to something Councillor Malls raised. You said you were concerned about the number of buses that make a left-hand turn coming out of the high school. There is virtually an equal number of buses who make the left-hand turn coming off of Shore Road with a full bus of children after they've gone out and up Mitchell Road to pick up the north end of town and they come down shore and they make a left into that intersection. So if, if you do have a concern about buses, it's equally um, valid concern at that intersection where the buses are full of children when they make that turn. I'd just like to say that I am not in favor of applying for the funds for this traffic signal. Um, I mean, it does not come up to the, that critical right factor, that intersection, um, to warrant a, a light in Department of Transportation or whatever standards those are. Um, but also, I, I'm more in favor of doing one step at a time, in a way, the way uh, Constance Lispriata mentioned, seeing how something works. I, I would rather do the the lane and the pavement widening and marking a new lane at the high school, and I would rather even consider reconfiguring the Shore Road Scott Dyer intersection. If those don't work, then maybe a traffic signal was warranted, but I'd like to try the least intrusive method first. If we go through the PACS process and we're granted an opportunity to get these funds, when would we have to come up with the matching funds? What fiscal year? We'd probably need to come up with them in the year, construction year 2007, so fiscal year 2007. To come out of the uh, proportion of the, the roadway damage account, just about that allocation. And it'd probably be 85, 15 money. Would have to come fifteen percent of the cost. I know we're going to discuss this next about um, Irwin's Road, but it kind of dovetails with what he asked about when when would that money that fifteen percent match? That's like a two million dollar project, right? Or yes, the memo says a fifteen percent match of that. And again, in the memo, I mentioned it's, it's unlikely that all two or all three projects would be approved, but it would be that same time frame. That same, but. I would sense that that would be done in phases. That's why the growing capital project. If they're, Bob, if they're not approved in the same time frame, do they uh, sort of automatically come back up again next year for consideration? Is there some sort of queue in which they're They'd have to be resubmitted again? next year. So, so it's a two-year process. This is our last shot. For two years. For two years, then it would come up again in what, 2006 for implementation in 2008 and 2009. Okay. Councilor We're going to apply to PACS to try and get some funding for the light in front of the high school. Let's say we apply to PACS for the funding for the light on Scott Dyer Shore Road intersection. Is there any way in which we kind of direct which preference we have to which light we'd like approved first. I mean, they're probably similar costs to PACs. 
In other words, if we send these two proposals out, can they come back and say, well, we approved the one in Shore Road, but we don't approve the one in front of the high school? Tax has a substitution point, point. policy mm -hmm. that if you substitute one that's not funded for one that is funded, you can apply for the one that was funded for another five years, is it? I believe so, yeah. Is it, another you that two biennium project. You, you can if or you, you can't? If you have one that's funded, and then you get those money transferred into another project, you, you then can't apply for the one that was funded for at least two more cycles, I believe is what they finally ended up. But that said, you know, we would, you know, that's only once they've been approved or once they're in the DTIP. If, if, you know, in October, what you'd want to do is, if you weren't happy with the result, you could, we would keep it out of the DTIP so it wouldn't get to that point where, where we would, you know, give up our opportunity for four years. You could fully review that. I'm very sympathetic to the financial concerns raised by Councillor Swift-Teata and others. But I'd like to suggest, since it is a two-year cycle, and it, we're at the beginning of the two-year cycle, and um, it, it's been made clear to us tonight by the manager that we can revisit this in October, that we authorize the manager to apply for this knowing that it can be revisited in October. Wait a minute. And it's not can be revisited. Will be. If it's, if it's funded, it must be revisited. Okay. Thank you. So that I wouldn't see us in any worse position in October. Um, we'd be in a better position. We would know whether or not we have the grant um, or grants, two or three of them. And um, we're not looking at this year's budget, but we will be starting to look at the following year's budget. So I, I think that it makes sense to make the application now um, and it doesn't foreclose us from not going down that road, so to speak, in October. Yeah. Councillor Lynch is very persuasive, but um, I'm afraid I have to disagree. That's, that is a similar argument to be signing petitions for things that you don't really want because you want to give them the opportunity to get on the ballot. And then sometimes you end up with things that you don't want on the ballot. So to me, it seems as I don't like to apply for things that I don't want in the, in the first place. And, and I truly don't believe um, that uh, we should be applying for money for, a, I think it gives momentum for light at, at uh, the town center. I don't think we should be applying for it and sort of muddying the waters perhaps on the other two projects, which I think are much more worthy, the high school light and the Kerwin uh, road front. Um, I, I cannot imagine that in the fall, looking at it a second time, I'm not going to have any more information about the real life impact of the high school light on what would really happen. And, and I think the high school light, according to the engineer, may well help the town center track situation. Um, so it was a good effort, but I'm not persuaded. I was persuaded, however. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor of, we don't have a motion? <laughs> After all that discussion? Thank you, Deborah. Can I have a motion from Councilor Gasser? Um, I will. I, I move that the council authorize uh, the town to uh, apply for um, tax funding for the three projects outlined in the memo um, from the, the other three. We already decided one of them, David. We already voted oh, on okay. that. Oh, so okay. We're only, we're only looking at two. I'm sorry. Yeah, 133. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I knew that. Um, <laughs> apply. It's late. Apply for funding for the signalization of the Shore Road, Scott Dyer Road, Route 77 intersection, and the full depth reconstruction of Furwink Avenue, as outlined in a memo from um, our public works director. No, no, no. Wait, no. no. We're gonna, we should take those. We're on item 
133. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had separated them. I'm sorry. Well, they apologize. are separate. Okay. I apologize. Then limited to 133, the signalization of Shore Road, Skytire Road, and Route 77. Okay. Is there a second? Sorry. Second. Okay. And we've already had our discussion. So that's all in favor? One, two, three, four. Opposed? One, two, three. And we have Robert Swift and Swift opposed. Okay. Item 134. It's an action upon a recommendation from the Public Works Director. Uh, did you say Robert again? Did you I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. McGinty. You have it. I apologize to Councillors McGinty <laughs> and Roberts. <laughs> you all start to look alike by the end of the night. <laughs> Councillor Fritz looks real different. <laughs> John has the hair. Okay. <laughs> so does Carol. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Item 134, action upon a request from the Public Works Director to request PACs to review for possible funding the full depth construction of Spurwink Avenue from the Spurwink Church to the entrance to the Perputic Club. So moved. Second. Okay, Bob, would you like to yeah, talk I, a little bit about Yeah, many of you have traveled Spurwink. I'm sure you're very aware of the condition. Uh, probably the worst section is between Wells Road and, and Bowery Beach Road, Spurwink Church, but it, it's a very large project. Uh, the, Paving failure is very obvious. The road has poor drainage and poor uh, geometry. And really, in, to enable us to, to repair the road properly, we really need to apply for PACs for funding assistance for this. And it's our last. Uh, most of our collectors in town are in pretty decent shape. But it's the last remaining road that, that really needs some help. And uh, again, no guarantees on on the funding and, and where it's going to fall in the uh, rating process. We did apply uh, last year to PACs. Uh, for funding for this. It, it never rates well because of our vehicle travel counts are always down. Uh, but they have changed the formula to give more weight to pavement condition rating, uh, which it should rate very highly there, I would think. So uh, it's our hope to submit it and uh, see where it falls in the mix. Councilor Fritz. I'm going to ask um, Bob Malley, how wide would the pavement be? Would we be keeping the same width of the pavement? Right now it varies between 22 and 23. I would propose that we have a consistent 24 based on its classification in the subdivision ordinance. I'm, I'm thinking that while we are totally rebuilding that road, I think that we should have the two paved lanes and then a two and a half foot um, a shoulder, paved shoulder. Uh, for bicycle and walking with with white lines on the side. I mean, in in like say in Fowler Road situation where we were just repaving, that would have been way too more expensive to rebuild the shoulders that were not paved to give support to that. But when we're doing when we're rebuilding the shoulders anyway and reconstructing the whole road, I think we should go with a two and a half foot on either side for walking and biking. Councilor McGinty. Isn't there some requirement of how the width of the bike lane has to be if we take the money? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to play by MDOT's rules and regulations, and the project would come back to you for final design if it was, in fact, approved, and that would have to be a, a dialogue with MDOT. So then it would be with federal regulations well, I mean, can can we do it and not call it a bike path? I think I we found with Fowler Road that we had to, con you know, conform to the MDOT regulations, and that's why we went with a simple paving project. Because if we u utilize those funds, the manager can correct me, we had to conform to the MDOT federal regulations. Michael, any any use of federal funds you need to uh, comply with the MDOT regulations. Uh, the MDOT regulations, though, you know, we would simply not indicate that this is a bikeway. Exactly. Would, would, would indicate shoulders. that it's paved shoulders. There are some environmental and uh, impacts with the road that's doing that. There's some ledge outcrops in various areas. It's, it's going to be a large project. Brook. There's, there's two brooks, three brooks we'd have to cross, and it, it would be a major project. 
But as I looked at the road, um, I mean, it's not like Shore Road where there are rock walls or trees close by. It's pretty much already built out as far as the shoulder so that you wouldn't be taking down trees and that sort of thing. So it seems to me a simpler way to make it. I guess the question, when we were doing Fowler Road, the reason we didn't do it right in the first place was because we were told we only had so much money and there was not going to be any more money available. And now we're talking about doing Sperling Avenue and doing that one right. Somebody want to explain to me what's going on? I'd, I'd be happy to. Fowler Road had already been funded and the, they had changed the standards so that we had to uh, comply with all the federal standards. In this in instance, it's a new application. We know up front that we need to apply with, with the federal standards and we're asking for a budget based on full depth construction, whereas on Fowler Road we, we asked for a budget based on reclamation and they came back at us and said, no, you can't just do reclamation. And it ended up we just did, did a paving and uh, we turned the money back in. The extra money. We paid for the paving ourselves. If we followed Councillor Fritz's recommendation, uh, do would we have to take any land by eminent domain or buy any land from anyone to make the road that wide? There's a 50 foot right of way along the entire okay. roadway right now. We, they may require some drainage and slope easement, um, but that would have ought to be worked out during the design phase. It hasn't been designed yet either, so we can't say for sure. But we're giving our best guess price when we submit it, or do they work out the price as it goes along? MDOT comes back with a very rough construction estimate. Okay, so we don't have to tell them between now and the 16th the cost. Any further discussion? Well, uh, the motion has been made to be um, submitted as, as in the agenda. Yeah. Um, Correct, and seconded. I guess I would like to ask that that, that road be designed, or add an amendment, that that road be designed with a two and a half foot uh, paved shoulder, in addition to the paved land. I wouldn't second that, but you know we're looking out what three years or something. I wouldn't want to make a design decision tonight based on who knows what will happen in three years. Um, so I couldn't support that, I think. So, but what is this um, cost estimate based on? Because is there a design decision being made with this cost estimate? Would this cost it? You know what I mean? Does this, this $2 million cost estimate is that for a road without paved shoulders? I like the idea of the paved shoulder, but when you apply for it, do we have to use this estimate that's already here, or can we apply for something with the paved shoulder? I mean, does it, are we constrained? They will do another. Pay, they will do another cost estimate. That's an estimate that was derived uh, out of a backlog list of roads, and then yeah. they'll compute a new cost estimate based on our proposal. So if we propose to them, if the town proposes as part of the PACS application, a road with a two and a half foot paved shoulder on each side, then that's our proposal, as opposed to this pr this proposal is a road with no paved shoulders. No. 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 It, no. This this is an estimate based on. This would come, even though we're in the urban area technically, this road is really a rural connector in every fashion. It serves as a rural connector, it looks like one. This is the based on the per lane mile cost for, for a full depth reconstruction of a rural connector. Uh, when so you reconstruct a, a rural connector, you generally, uh, you get into issues of changing the vertical alignments, you get into, into issues of uh, the depth of the materials, you get into drainage improvement, and you also get into uh, the, the lane width, the shoulder width, and the drainage uh, slope coming off the road. So does a rural connector, which is what this is, 
what our application will be. Can a rural, rural connector have a paved shoulder, or are you saying? Yes, it can. I'm I'm yeah. So it can. Yes. Okay. So we can apply for something with a paved shoulder. Yeah, I, but I wouldn't want to, without having looked at anything in the field, in you know doing the environmental analysis of crossing. Uh, uh, what's the name of the brook down there? Well, you've got actually the Burling River. Mm -hmm. Burling, Burling River. You you've got two brooks. Pollock Brook. Pollock Brook. You know, I, I wouldn't want to define it that closely at this early stage. No, I, I would doing encourage looking at it. I think it's a good idea. I mean, if there's some technical reason it can't be done, then it can't be done. But it, it strikes me we're either applying for something with it or without it. And, and if we're going to make a decision, I understand um, Councilman McGinty saying we don't want to make design decisions this soon, but it sort of sounded like we already had made a design decision by saying we couldn't do a, a paved shoulder, but now I hear that we can. So. Uh, uh, all I'm saying is the design standard for these types of roads is, is a small paved shoulder. Uh, you know, and that's something would work out through, through discussion as, as time goes on. Uh, but then I so would my concern is just you saying, you know, on the very first day without any review of, of plan saying it shall be two and a half feet, then that's, I, that's just making it too tight too quick. Then I would recommend looking at it, uh, not making it a requirement of the application, but I would encourage looking, I mean, that's my personal view. I don't know if the rest of the council wants it to be looked at. But, but if we I, were to encourage that as they develop the road design, they do it with a paved shoulder consistent with easing pedestrian and Yeah, that's fine. Right. I'm, I'm not trying to tie up the process. No, I, I, no, that's I'm, why I said just easing pedestrian traffic so that it's not a bike path. It's just a paved I mean, shoulder. I have to be really clear. I'm not proposing a bike path that's five feet wide on either side. That is, mm -hmm. I would totally oppose that. But I think it might be good to have a sense of the council for the direction for the design and proposal that that, that we want something narrow. Councilor Mull? If it proceeds forward and we get the tax funding and we match our 15% as that come out of the capital improvement budget, or you could, or the council could decide to bond it, or you know, to, you know, if Pulaski passes, you know, <laughs> there's, you under that, you know, if that bonding yeah, provision that passes that. within there, that's the way to do a lot of this stuff. Can I suggest uh, that we capital. move the question, and then we can have a separate motion just on the sense of the council, encouraging Bob and Mike to mm -hmm. explore. Good okay. idea. So all in favor of the motion, four, five, six, seven, thank you. And then I would move that we encourage Michael and Bob to explore um, expanding the, pave, the paved shoulder to enhance or in some way accommodate pedestrian access. Second. Passage and access. Second. All in any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, it's not on your agenda, but item 135 has come out of the discussion that Councillor Backer and I had this afternoon again on the school building committee. Do we have to? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do we need to vote to amend the pick up on the suspend the rules to pick up the item? Okay. Thank you. Um, do I need to explain first what we're suspending the rules for or just ask to suspend the rules? Uh, you okay. really ought to explain what we're mm -hmm. suspending the rules for. Okay. The charter for the school building committee um, basically provides that once the bids are awarded, um, all responsibility for the project lies with the superintendent of the schools. We're entering an intra, I don't think anyone contemplated that Tom would leave back in, whenever we did this charter, I guess last December. And um, what we thought is it, 
the project still needs to have one owner, if you will. But um, we thought in light of the superintendent leaving that perhaps we should add language to the charter that the superintendent or acting superintendent, as the case may be, shall continue to consult with the building committee for the duration of the project. And by the charter, do you mean the charge? To the charge to the school building committee, yes. Yeah. What was it? Say that. What again did you want to change the language to? We will not to suspend the rules. So okay. Get a position. I move we suspend the rules so we can take something out of order. Second. All in favor? Okay, seven zero. Sorry, this is stuck. Uh, Councilor Swift, I have a second. Okay. You, I made, you the made the motion. But whatever. Who seconded? Councilor Swift. Okay. John, your question? I just didn't catch the end, what, what you wanted to change it to. Okay, we wanted, we talked about it, David, may, I don't know if you took notes as we were talking this afternoon. I just thought we talked along the lines of having the superintendent continue to consult with school building committee. So, so you mean, so when the superintendent goes off and there's a new superintendent who knows nothing about the project, the building committee will be this transitional manager no okay no the, the the superintendent will still be the manager yeah or the acting superintendent who there will be one or the other mm -hmm. but that as we go forward they will continue to consult with the school building committee on the project and presumably maybe we need to make this clear but keep in keep us informed of the project the cost the schedule make sure it's in keeping with and what was approved by the voters. And would the committee be doing anything else other than being informed or would it be making any decisions or votes or no recommendations? Recommendations, yes. David, I don't know if you had more artful language. Well, practicing the, the charge as currently written um, says once the bids are awarded, including the scope of work and pricing developed with the construction managers for the high school, the responsibility to move the projects forward is with the superintendent of schools and not with the building committee. We're recognizing that our superintendent of schools will be leaving uh, soon. The proposal would be to amend the original charge by changing that particular sentence. And the specific proposal would be to have it read, the school building committee shall remain in existence beyond the award of bids and shall work in conjunction with the school superintendent in seeing both the Pond Cove addition and high school renovation through to substantial completion as defined by the respective construction documents for each project. So the way it stands now, the way the charge is now, is that the, the building committee is out of it at what point once the bids are awarded? Once the bids are awarded. So when the bids are <laughs> awarded, then the building committee just sort of disappears? As, as it stands the now. charge is currently written, yes. I think for continuity's sake, I suppose that's why we're doing it, with the superintendent leaving. I mean, I think there needs, I mean, I would support this, but, you know, nothing, I mean, we're gonna have a brand new superintendent, presumably he's gonna walk into this, you know, building chaos. And just when he might want to get some information from the building committee, it's a dissolve. Dissolve, yeah. Well, that's, and that's exactly yeah. our concern. Yeah, sure. I would support it. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Michael? Yeah, you know, the other piece that, you know, you haven't addressed is, you know, if there was a, if there was a major change, if there was any change in scope of the project, you know, it's, it's traditional that a building committee review that change in scope, not a, not a, you know, a, a change order that, you know, they discover that, you know, there's a scheme that needs to be moved or, or uh, you know, those types of things, but, you know, 
there, there are issues that come up that, you know, that there can be a change in scope. And I would think that the building committee uh, would want to would want to approve uh, change orders uh, that are not emergency in nature that are over you know, twenty thousand dollars or something like that. I would add that mm -hmm. to it because if the bids come in radically more mm -hmm. than the estimate, there's going to have to be some cutting. Mm -hmm. Or and if they come in radically less, then somebody's going to have to decide what else goes in there. And um, I think it would be good to have broad representation from the building committee who's been around for a while too, rather than throw it on a new superintendent who I'm sure will be a wonderful asset, but is going to be sort of clueless uh, just because of being totally new. So I think that would be, um, I don't know how to word that, uh, that in, but I like the concept mm -hmm. um, of having the building committee. I would add, was that a motion you made? If, if that was a motion, I would add to it. I, I didn't formally make it as a motion, no. So the floor is wide open for the motion. Well, I would move <laughs> what you said plus the building committee. Um, the word. To review changes in scope. Review major changes in scope. Change orders over 20,000. Change orders over 20,000. It's not an, an emergency basis. Pardon me? That's not of emergency. That are not of no, emergency. Wanna, emergency base. The thing yeah, is, you, you don't want to hold up the whole project. That's yeah. right. Because pipes broke or something. Mm -hmm. the, the other piece is, you know, with all our other building committees, the, the building committee has received copies of all change orders in summary form, you know, from time to time, time or, the, or the council has. And, you know, you might want to put something in that, you know, you receive a summary of change orders on a quarterly basis or something like that as well for the building committee. I would add that to my president's motion. Okay. You also this is my own motion. You would also mention that the bids come in too high, higher than authorized the by the voters. Major changes in scope, which is what would happen. That would cover if, it yeah, if yeah. the bids were Either way, way too high or way too low. Councillor Mulls and then Councillor Roberts. I'm in favor of this. What I can't help but wonder is when we're done discussing what the motion is, if we might want to get that down in print and have our final vote on it Wednesday night, since we're going to be having one other little piece of business tied over to Wednesday night, just so that we can see it in print in front of us. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to voting on it tonight, but I just throw that out as a suggestion so we can actually see in front of us what we're, what we're voting on. I guess I'd, my comments would be limited to with a new superintendent coming on board and we have no idea whether he has any prior building or construction experience so I think the having that the committee carry forward is a, is a great idea um, I I like some language that actually <laughs> makes it that the building committee is going to receive some of this material and some of this information uh, and I had a question, I guess, to the town manager, where it's a school building project. Is the superintendent the one that, or somebody on the school side, supposed to oversee this, or could somebody like the town manager be actually put in charge of that? The superintendent oversees school construction projects. Okay. You know, I'm comfortable with either tonight or Wednesday. Doesn't matter to me. Councilor Fritz. Well, I, um, it makes sense to me to maybe have the wording drafted and have it before us on Wednesday, and maybe there are some other things that the manager feels would make sense to be put in here that could be added in the draft. That, that's fine. We can certainly do the wordsmithing for Wednesday. I can reread what... I've got so far based on mm -hmm. the discussions I've heard tonight. Shall I? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, then I would withdraw my motion and make. Well, I don't want to table it yet. No. Somebody else wants to table. Why don't we have David reread what he has, and then I think a motion to table it would be in order. The school building committee shall remain in existence beyond the award of bids and shall work in conjunction with the school superintendent 
in seeing both the Pond Cove addition and high school renovation through to substantial completion as defined by the respective construction documents for each project. All change orders to the scope of the work in excess of $20,000 and not of an emergency nature shall be approved by the building committee. That pay it? I mean, do we need to take it? I mean, that's not as good as the thing. That's fine. I mean, I, I don't and see I, the need to take that, that language. Second. I think we'll amend the charge to include that language for pay to perform. Any further discussion? Does the manager think that covers it? All in favor? Three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Could, could we just get a copy of the new charge? As soon as we get it from Councilor Backer. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I send it uh, by email to our town clerk in the morning? Oh, we'd love that. <laughs> we'd love that. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, we're now at that point in our agenda. Citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda and seeing only our loyal fourth estate here <laughs> and Deborah Lane and the table operator. Um, I think we'll just go to adjournment. Um, Councilor Swift had already mentioned that we have a workshop on Wednesday. Yes, night. We, well, we have not a workshop, we have a finance, a finance committee, committee work. Okay, oh, I tend to be right. And it's at 7.30, it's at 7.30, but. And we're calling a special we're, council meeting for. But that would be at 7.30. So the finance committee meeting would immediately follow the special council meeting? The finance committee will immediately follow the special council meeting. Okay. And I would prefer to move it up to seven if that works for everyone just in light of adding more we'll have a long night potentially with the school me okay. yeah uh, that's true because we have the school by the school board members are all planning on being there at 7 30 and you know what i mean it's, i'm not sure it would be right to just make them sit through that's right Other although discussion. because we'll be discussing the patent contract some of well, them may want to be there but that's we'll move up the council meeting well the council meeting will be at seven and then the finance committee meeting will be at seven thirty and will we um uh let the school board members know so that if they yes. want to come at seven they can yes i will contact uh them tomorrow and i have something i'd like to say about the finance committee meeting in a minute but okay I well i was tomorrow. just going to ask if we start at seven and things progress quickly and we're done at 7 15 then do we have to like take a 15 minute break before we start the finance committee meeting or can we just keep rolling right through should we have them prepared immediately fall immediately it's, it's been advertised for 7 okay yeah since it's televised yeah. yeah everyone's watching <laughs> <Everyone's watching. laughs> it's like right now right <laughs> Well, well we could I just end up taking a little break. Could I j just let my fellow finance committee members remind them that um, they should have gotten material from Paulina Portria relevant to the school budget in their boxes or no in their packets I guess in your packets uh, last week. Um, I've reviewed that. If you have questions, let me know. And um, I. I think I mentioned this before, but I'm not sure everyone was still here. I will be, um, after our discussion with the school board, I will be polling the finance committee and we will be having a finance committee vote on the um, school board budget so that um, I would like to ask everyone on the finance committee to be prepared to talk about well, to vote yay or nay on something and to be prepared to discuss a certain number or a certain percentage increase, Nathan, uh, decrease, percentage increase that um, they would vote for. So we need to be specific in order that we can give guidance to the school board so that if there are any changes from what they have proposed, if we give them back any different numbers, they have time to deal with it and figure out what they're going to do because they may want to come back to us okay. and I, i'll be i'll be trying to get a hold of you tomorrow just to see if everybody has questions
Thank you, Ian. I think we still need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you.